No, we are here. You can both write that. I All right, let's um let's go ahead and get started so that we can stay on time here. Um, welcome to the last session uh, of PEQG 2022. Um, this is the session chair session, so early career folks that have been chairing all the sessions you, you've heard throughout the conference, they'll each have half hour keynotes. Um, please stick around after the third talk and right before the break, I'll announce the poster awards and the Crow Award. Uh, so please stick around, uh, it'll shorten the break uh, just a little bit. But we'll start off the session with Nancy Chen um, talking about indirect genetic effects across life cycle stages in a cooperatively breeding bird. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share some ongoing work in my lab with you all this afternoon. Um, before I begin, I wanted to point out that the work I'll be talking about today are um, really work done by my collaborators, Gladiana Spitz, Elissa Cosgrove, and Andy Clark. You can see unmasked photos of them here. I forgot to put one of myself, but that's fine. Um, also, I wanted to acknowledge that most of the work I'm talking about today was done on the colonized lands of the Onondawaga or Seneca Nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So as many of you all know, kind of one of, a fun, one of the fundamental goals in evolutionary biology is to understand the causes and consequences of variation in phenot individual phenotypes, right? We know there's so much variation in wonderful, beautiful phenotypic variation in nature, what causes them? And we've seen a lot of really great presentations over the past few days trying to tackle this question. And it goes without saying to this audience, right, that phenotypic variation is composed of both genetic and environmental components. But I would say what's a little bit less well appreciated is the fact that social interactions can cause phenotypes of individuals to depend on the genes carried by other individuals. So these effects are called indirect genetic effects or IGEs. And these occur when an individual's phenotype is influenced by genetic variation in conspecific individuals. So all organisms interact with conspecifics during some part of their life cycle, which means that opportunities for indirect genetic effects to influence variation in fitness and phenotypes are ubiquitous. Maybe one of the most kind of commonly studied indirect genetic effects are maternal effects, right? It's easy to think that offspring um, size or uh, fitness is gonna be dependent on paternal care or maternal or paternal care. And there may be heritable variation and parental care that affects kind of offspring phenotypes. And there's been quite a bit of work looking at kind of maternal effects across ontogeny and different organisms. And some work has found that maternal effects 
um, explain more phenotypic variants in juvenile traits than in kind of adult um, traits. There's also been a lot of work in plant and animal breeding, looking at indirect genetic effects on individual growth rates or aggressive behaviors um, in livestock. And also um, there are indirect genetic uh, effects in observable in plants. So there's been a lot of fun work kind of looking at neighboring effects in eucalyptus trees. So indirect genetic effects can be common and it's really under, important to understand the impacts of indirect genetic effects because when phenotypes are influenced by both direct genetic effects and indirect genetic effects, that can affect the response to natural selection because um, it can either greatly accelerate the response to selection or constrain the response to selection, kind of depending on the nature of the interaction. So the, these figures here are showing kind of simulated trait means um, under three scenarios when there's no maternal effect, a positive maternal effect, or a negative maternal effect. Interactions between direct genetic effects and indirect genetic effects can also promote the maintenance of genetic and phenotypic diversity. And finally, if we fail to account for indirect genetic effects, we can obtain biased estimates of heritability and effect sizes um, and polygenic scores and whatnot. So the concept of indirect genetic effects has actually been modeled and explored in several different fields. Um, and one kind of unfortunate consequence is that all of these different fields use different terms um, for the same exact concept. And I'm just showing this here um, in hopes of promoting more crosstalk among disciplines and just highlighting kind of how much work has been done on indirect genetic effects so far. So quantitative models of indirect genetic effects have largely been constructed within two theoretical frameworks kind of following a historical dichotomy in maternal effects history. So there's a whole suite of models that are called trait-based models. Um, these follow from an extension of maternal effects models developed by Falconer 1965 and Kirkpatrick and Landy in 1989. Um, so these models kind of specify the indirect effect of the phenotype of a focal individual here noted as ZI as components of the additive genetic and environmental components of that focal individual, as well as the phenotype of a social partner individual I. And this effect can be scaled by the parameter psi ij, which is a regression coefficient describing the strength and direction of the effect of trait um, j on trait i. So these models are really nice in but it requires a priori knowledge of the mediating mechanisms and the ability to pinpoint which phenotypes um, underlie indirect genetic effects. And so the models that are actually more widely used empirically are variance component models. Um, so these kind of derive from work by Dickerson 1947, Wilhelm, Wilhelm 1963, and Griffin 1967. These are called variance components models. Um, they're very similar. They have been kind of developed into animal models. It's very similar to the animal models of Henderson 1965. And these models basically partition phenotypic variance into a direct um, component and an indirect genetic component. Uh, these two models are mathematically equivalent. Um, so it is, uh, you can calculate psi from different variance components, and this work has been done by McLaughlin and Brody. More recently, folks have extended this mixed modeling type approach to actually map the individual loci, um, giving rise to indirect genetic effects. And this approach has the ability to increase our knowledge of the mechanisms underlying um, indirect genetic effects. And also in human genetics, we've um, recently seen papers using structural equation models and polygenic scores from family-based designs um, to study indirect genetic effects. So there's been a lot of development in the theory of IGEs, um, but empirical studies of indirect genetic effects remain really challenging and difficult. 
And one of these reasons is that you just need a ton of data to be able to study indirect genetic effects, right? So you have to be able to measure interactions between individuals, which means you need some the ability to um, define social groups and know who's interacting with whom. You need the ability to collect phenotypes for lots of individuals and to infer relatedness, um, either relatedness of the social partners or ability to measure the traits of the partners that are mediating the indirect genetic effect. There are also a lot of um, confounding factors that indirect genetic effect studies need to consider. Um, so there's all of the like typical things you have to worry about in a GWAS. So thinking about population structure, assortative mating, and shared environment effects. Um, but here, it's also important to think about, you know, are there any potential confounding effects arising from non-random group formation or unequal interactions within a group? Finally, there's been a lot of work on um, maternal effects, empirical work on maternal effects, um, but there's less known about, there are fewer studies on paternal effects and even fewer studies looking at how indirect genetic effects may change over an individual's lifetime. So an ideal study system for the study of indirect genetic effects in the wild are one of these handful of long-term individual-based demographic studies where scientists have monitored a single population for decades and collected kind of extensive phenotype information and genotype information over time. And this is a system that I work on. So um, a lot of the work in my lab is in the Florida scrub jay, this beautiful blue bird here. Um, you may have seen its congener, the California scrub jay, uh, flying around outside. But unlike the birds you're seeing outside this room, Florida scrub jays are cooperative breeders. So that means offspring delay dispersal and stay home to raise offspring, uh, the future generations of offspring. These birds are restricted to this really uh, unique fire-maintained scrub habitat in Florida. And due to habitat destruction, um, they're actually federally threatened. And there's a lot of work on the conservation genetics of this group. Some of you may have seen um, Mitch Loki's poster earlier this conference. There are a few aspects about the biology of these birds that make them really amenable to long-term demographic studies. They're non-migratory and highly philopatric and territorial, which means that we can follow the same individuals throughout their lifetimes. Their dispersal distances are short, so we can also follow the lifetimes of their descendants. Um, they're socially and mostly genetically monogamous. So there is a very low extra pair paternity rate, but for the most part, we can construct fairly accurate pedigrees from field observations alone. It's also really important that these jays are really easy to work with because they are addicted to peanuts. Um, I will clarify that uh, this is not standard field protocol. <laughs> we typically try to interact with these birds as little as possible, but it is kind of fun that we have one or two individuals that are bold enough to land on your head and hand. So the population of Florida scrub jays has been studied extensively at Archville Biological Station since 1969. There's a lot of extensive field work that goes into the study. Um, the entire population is censused once a month, providing accurate information on individual lifespans for all of the individuals in our population over time. Every nest of every family group is found and monitored carefully. So we know the number of eggs laid in each nest. We know how many of those eggs hatch. Um, and we know the fates of all of those nestlings. Um, and that's really nice because we have the ability to obtain accurate measures of both annual and lifetime reproductive success for thousands of individuals in our population over time. Uh, we have the ability to collect direct measures of dispersal. And importantly for my work, um, my collaborators have collected blood samples for every nestling and recruit in our population starting in 1999, resulting in this really rich DNA archive um, of samples for all the individuals in our population going back for decades. Uh, we also have data on a number of different relevant ecological data, 
including habitat characteristics, climate measurements, fire history, food abundance, et cetera, giving us some ability to kind of model environmental heterogeneity when we're looking at variation in individual fitness and phenotypes. So over this past half century, what has happened is we've accumulated um, complete life history data and phenotypes for more than 10,000 individuals on a 14 generation pedigree. So this mass of line of six here, it's our population pedigree uh, as of 2013. I think you can add a few more rows now. Um, but as you can see, we have a fairly rich data set. And finally, um, we have fairly comprehensive genotyping of our population over time. So we've designed a custom Illuma iSelect B-chip, genotyped about 3,800 individuals at 12,000 SNPs across the genome. Uh, the plot on the bottom here is showing you the total number of individuals in our population in gray and the number of genotyped individuals in blue. So as you can see, we've genotyped nearly every individual in our population for the past kind of 15 or so years. And this wealth of genomic, environmental, demographic, and phenotypic data provides uh, a really powerful framework for directly testing core predictions of evolutionary biology and nature. So one of our overarching goals is to understand the causes and consequences of variation in individual fitness. From the demographic data, we know there's um, quite a bit of reproductive skew. Here I'm showing you the lifetime reproductive success or total number of offspring produced by about a thousand dead breeding adults in our population. And much of our work seeks to link that variation in individual fitness across generations to allele frequency change over time by tracking the inheritance of genomes down the pedigree and estimating individual genetic contributions. But we're also really interested in trying to do kind of a more fine scale dissection of fitness um, in this population. So we have an ongoing project using selection component analysis to try to identify regions of the genome that are associated with these four different fitness components. If you missed Elissa's poster yesterday, I encourage you to go online um, and check it out. So, so far we've identified about 25 loci under viability, sexual or fecundity selection and seven loci across the genome uh, with significant differences in lifetime reproductive success. And the thing is um, that we're working on now is that you know, we know social interactions can cause phenotypes, can cause indirect genetic effects. Um, and so we're starting to ask how indirect genetic effects are affecting these different fitness related traits. I don't actually know if it's possible for indirect genetic effects to affect segregation distortion, um, so if anyone has any thoughts on that, I would love to hear them. So we know the strength and nature of indirect genetic effects can vary between different traits and therefore could have really different consequences for these different fitness components. Uh, we're just starting to think about this problem now. So today I'm just gonna focus on viability selection. And more specifically, I'm gonna share some kind of hot off the presses results on the impact of indirect genetic effects on offspring weight and survival um, across ontogeny. So we've been looking at this question from kind of using two different approaches. First, I'll tell you about some work using animal models um, to partition phenotypic variants into additive genetic effects, indirect genetic and indirect genetic effects. And this is work done by a former undergraduate in the lab, Gladiana Spitz. Um, and then we've also been working on kind of incorporating indirect genetic effects into our genome-wide association studies. And this is work done in collaboration with Elissa Cosgrove and Andy Clark. These projects are still in the early stages, um, so I welcome feedback. All right. So with variance partitioning, here we're fitting um, animal models in ASRML R and we're uh, using just the pedigree to improve our sample size. So here we have data for about 3,000 offspring um, from 1990 to about 2020. And we're looking at offspring weight and survival. Um, we use the same fixed effects for every single trait. And these models were considering individual sex, kind of hatch order, hatch date, inbreeding coefficient, the number of helpers at the nest. And for the survival models, um, we include nestling weight. 
And for the random effects, we include the kinship matrix, the control for population stratification, natal year, and natal nest. Um, and then we model kind of maternal or paternal additive genetic or maternal or paternal genetic variation um, using a matrix of pairwise genetic relatedness between moms or dads. Um, and we also model parental or uh, parental environment effects as permanent differences between mothers and fathers. So we looked at offspring weight at two time points. Um, we weigh all of the nestlings when they're 11 days old, and then we catch them again and weigh them when they're about um, 60 to 80 days old. And so I'll use nestling weight to refer to day 11 weights um, and juvenile weight to refer to uh, the like 60 to 80 day old birds. So in Florida scrub days, um, they exhibit by parental care. Uh, and so we're interested in trying to understand kind of how much do maternal and paternal um, effects matter for these two different traits. One thing I should note is that um, male breeders and helpers do a lot more feeding of nestlings in the Florida scrub jays and female breeders contribute more to feeding um, later on uh, in the offspring's lifespan. So here are results from our variance components models showing you the results for nestling weight on top and juvenile weight on bottom. Yellow indicates the proportion of variance due to additive genetic effects. Um, the greens give you the social effects, so either maternal genetic environmental effects or paternal genetic and environmental effects. Um, and then year, nest, and other residual uh, effects. So you can see that kind of additive, the heritability of juvenile weight is a lot larger than the heritability of nestling weight. We can zoom into the uh, maternal and paternal effects a little bit more. So on the plot on the bottom here, I'm showing you the social environmental effect in dark green, the social genetic effect in light green, and then the total combined effect of maternal or paternal effects in gray. Um, our error bars are kind of large because our pedigree-based estimates of relatedness are a little noisy. Um, we don't have significant maternal or paternal effects, though it's interesting that our estimates for paternal effects are larger than our estimates for maternal effects, especially since we know that um, dad is really responsible for feeding the nestlings a lot more than mom is. For survival, we considered kind of, we fit logistic regression models, asking whether or not a given individual survived to key life stages. So here's the typical life of a Florida scrub jay. We uh, banned all of the nestlings when they're 11 days old. So that's when we can start our analyses. Scrub jays fledge or leave the nest when they're about 18 days old. Um, and they just like hang out and pretend to be pine cones until around day 30. So day 30, they're moving around a little bit more. By day 90, they're nutritionally independent from their parents. By day 300, they're physiologically capable of breeding, so they're sexually mature. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have established to become a breeder. And so that's a separate life stage. So generally, as an individual ages, uh, we would expect that the strength of parental effects would decrease over time. And there's been some evidence of this in uh, red deer and some other systems. Um, and so we were curious to see whether or not kind of the strength of indirect genetic, how the strength of indirect genetic effects changes over ontogeny in the scrub jays. Um, so here, once again, are the variance component analysis results. Yellow is additive genetic effects, green are the kind of maternal or paternal effects, um, and then purple is everything else. Uh, and so you can see that we have lower estimates of additive genetic variation for our survival traits compared to nestling weight, which is consistent with a lot of work showing kind of lower heritabilities of traits important to fitness. Um, but we do see kind of larger uh, social genetic effects um, for survival. And if we zoom in um, to look at the social genetic environmental effects, uh, we actually detect kind of significant maternal and paternal effects for survival 
of nestlings from day 30 to day 90. And there isn't that much evidence of um, kind of decreasing indirect genetic effects over life um, since our highest estimates are for day 30 to day 90. And then I guess it sort of decreases once they reach nutritional independence, uh, which makes sense. Uh, moving on to looking at genome-wide association studies, um, we use mixed models to try to map uh, regions of the genome associated with offspring weight and survival. Um, unlike the, so once again, here the phenotypes are either weight or survival. We include the kinship matrix in natal year and natal nest as random effects. Um, and then we have a whole suite of other potential fixed effects. So we do a step of variable selection to figure out which of these effects significantly influence each of our traits before then fitting the effect of each genotype of the SNPs um, in performing the GWAS. So in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to show you some results for nestling weight. So for our nestling weight models, we needed to include individual sex, patch order, inbreeding coefficient, um, and various aspects of its natal nest. Um, so if we do those effects, this is kind of your standard GWAS. We find um, no hits after testing for multiple, uh, multiple tests. Um, but if you think about kind of traditional population-based GWAS estimates, the effect sizes that we estimate actually include kind of assortative mating and indirect genetic effects, right? So if you think about kind of a parent offspring trio, parents can have direct genetic effects on the offspring phenotype via the alleles they actually transmit to their offspring. But parental phenotypes, like the genotypes of the two parents will affect their phenotypes, which may have indirect genetic effects on offspring phenotype. And there are a number of different ways to try to estimate these indirect genetic effects for alleles um, in your genome. And the approach that we took was looking at the non-transmitted allele, right? So if you have trios in your data, you have the ability to determine which allele was actually transmitted from parent to offspring. Um, you can then fit models where you directly assess associations between the non-transmitted allele and offspring phenotype. And that gives you a sense of um, the indirect genetic effects of that parent. So if we look at um, just offspring weight, um, this is what I showed you before. We didn't find anything interesting. If you fit the non-transmitted maternal allele, you also don't find um, any particular hits. Um, but interestingly enough, if we fit models for the paternal non-transmitted allele. We actually find kind of six regions of the genome that are associated with offspring fitness. And this is consistent with our models showing that, you know, larger parental or paternal genetic effects for nestling weight, um, which once again is consistent with what we know about the parental care behavior of floor chase. Okay, so to quickly summarize, um, in our system, we took two different approaches uh, to study the impacts of indirect genetic effects on offspring weight and survival. Paternal effects seem to be a lot more important than maternal effects in um, offspring weight. Which, and if we run kind of GWAS estimates for non-transmitted parental alleles, we actually find evidence for significant non-transmitted um, non paternal alleles on nestling weight. And these results kind of make sense given what we know about feeding behavior in the Florida scrub jays. Um, and we have some preliminary evidence of maternal genetic effects and paternal genetic effects on offspring survival. So none of the work I would do would be possible without the hard work of many uh, staff, students, and interns at Archival Biological Station. I'd like to thank my wonderful collaborators and students and my funding sources and thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions if I have time.
Uh, hey, how's it going? Elliot Fenton from Harvard. Um, I was wondering if you've taken a look at these GWAS hits and see if they like make sense if they're like in genes associated with behavior or with feeding or anything like that. Um, that's a good question. We're still working on annotating our genome right now, but that's like the next step. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Anna from um, University of Edinburgh. Um, that was a really good talk, as always. Um, <laughs> but um, the variance in your nest effects, um, I was wondering how you managed to tease apart the variance in the nest effects versus the variance in the social genetic effects and whether there was like any interaction there or how you could actually like partition them out well. <laughs> um, so we fit nest ID as a random effect um, and many of our individuals will have multiple nests um, and so that's how we're distinguishing between nest effects and then our because then we include mom id or um, dad id as a random effect to get the to estimate the maternal or paternal indirect indirect effects all right okay cool okay let's thank nancy one more time Our next speaker is Lauren Crawford. Uh, we'll be talking about association and fine mapping with Bayesian machine learning methods. Awesome. Uh, this has been a great uh, meeting. Um, hi, my name is Lauren Crawford. I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research and a professor at Brown University. Um, for those of you who may not know me, um, and I'm going to talk a lot about self-identifying here, I self-identify as a statistician um, who kind of works across many different domains and uh, thinking about taking pieces of those uh, things to kind of understand this genotype to phenotype map. Um, so a big part of my research program is the idea of many, like many in this room, dissecting phenotypic variation. Uh, here we have 131 different phenotypes from uh, a panel of mice uh, broken up into six broad groups. And I'm really trying to build stat and machine learning methods to basically understand this pie, right? Like how much of genetic effects come from additivity uh, and this nonlinear piece, you could break that down into pairwise interactions, third order interactions, and then also thinking about the idea of gene by environmental interactions. Um, and so a big, part of the things I look for is how to move past just the linear model. And so if we think about the generative model for uh, for complex traits, you can basically write this as uh, uh, going back to like your stat regression class, uh, this linear model here, where we have uh, some phenotype and we regress our, our genotypes onto it uh, in this high dimensional N by P matrix. Um, and really the point of this slide here is to kind of show that this generative model uh, is, I'm trying to understand the true effect of each SNP onto uh, my phenotype of interest. And so beta J kind of lends some notion of evidence that we use for uh, a bunch of tasks downstream. Now we call this an underdetermined system in, in statistics uh, because in a lot of our studies, N is much less than P. And so I can't necessarily get to the true additive effect directly. Instead what we do is we, we really look for uh, marginal associations with SNPs where I take each SNP in turn, right? And I run some regression model where I have my phenotype. Um, I have some uh, a copy of a reference allele I try to control for some covariates, and I really try to get this idea of what's the effect from, a, from an approximation perspective of each SNP's effect onto the, the trait, right? Now, with these betas, I can do a ton of things downstream, right? So we've heard of a few talks this week of uh, one on this idea of phenotypic prediction, right? And this is a, a really hard task, and I think a lot of people in this room are doing great uh, things to try to overcome the difficulties in this space, right? And this, the, 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 our issues in this space are primarily broken down to a ton of issues, right? Um, one is that I'm trying to take this, trying to estimate from this joint model, this marginal approximation. And so we have these marginal effects uh, in, that are not quite um, uh, well accounted for from a joint perspective because of things like LD structure, right? Or other plausible effects where, um, you know, I have this high correlation and I might be estimating uh, uh, or inflating the effect of one SNP by not controlling for the other ones in the data set, right? Um, so that's not exactly the space that I'm going to talk about today. The talk I'm going to talk about today is task two, which is this idea of association and fine mapping, 
right? And the, the whole idea here is once I estimate those betas, I can derive some standard errors, right? Then I can derive p-values from them. And I can start to look down for downstream tasks for, for associations, either on a given genomic position or, or maybe like look at the genes that are associated in that given space, right? And the whole idea here of, of association mapping is the idea of testing a null hypothesis, right? I think that's the idea of, I'm gonna get to this notion of interpretability. That's really where interpretability really lives in, in our space, right? So under the setting where there's no genetic signal, the betas for each of my SNPs should be equal to zero, right? Um, so with that, there's some common assumptions that we that we make in this space. One is that, uh, and that allows us to model phenot uh, uh, genetics uh, differently depending on in that linear model uh, that I just showed above. One is that there's there's a common assumption that variance variation among common traits and phenotypes are driven by uh, a few mutations with uh, some moderately large effect, right? And what we do with this is we can associate this to priors in our model, right? We can assume that maybe a lot of SNPs have zero effect and some are, are kind of off in these tails and like the spike and slab type of meth, uh, regime. We can also get a little bit more fancy and say maybe some traits or some SNPs have very large effect, some have no effect, and then others maybe are this kind of intermediate model, right? So we have this mixture model. And our assumptions about that, that distribution of SNP effects really drive how we end up doing our modeling. Um, the second is that similar mutations drive the architecture of disease across individual patients and, and, and ancestries, right? And we've had people talk this week about how that may not necessarily be true, particularly with the underrepresentation of groups in different biobanks and consortia, right? Um, and I don't have to show people uh, this slide per se. I think everyone probably can quote the figure caption for the one on the left. Um, but I do want to draw attention to this idea of the disparities across uh, representation of groups and data sets kind of leave us in two regimes. And the first regime is that we, we need to figure out a way to be more inclusive in who we include in these biobank sales studies. But the second one, which is the space that I'm working in, is complex data demand complex methods. In other words, we have data right now. How do I get information out of the data that I have available to me today? And so we build methods in this, in this space. Um, and so that really opens up this opportunity I think at least, uh, for interpretability questions in multi-ancestry studies. Um, and so, you know, you could break this down into a, a few interpretability challenges, I guess, in this space. So um, are causal variants, uh, you know, spread widely across the genome or are they clumped in relevant uh, genes and pathways? Uh, the second is, you know, to what extent does uh, genetic architecture of human complex traits vary across ancestry groups? Um, are the same regions enriched for contributions to broad sense heritability? Um, and one thing I've been focused on a lot recently is, you know, do GWAS results, meaning, uh, you know, SNPs and their effect sizes, um, estimated in one group transfer over to another, right, from an association perspective? And I've been claiming recently that the, that last question is, is really limited in scope, right? And I've been asking a lot of ways of thinking about what we call multi-scale modeling. And I'll get to that in a second, but I really want to take this time to kind of point out, I've been thinking about these questions a lot in uh, tandem with uh, Sohini Ramachandran from Brown University, uh, who messaged me yesterday to let you all know that she has FOMO from your tweets and that she will be hiring next fall. Um, <laughs> um, so when we move to this idea of a multi-scale uh, approach, uh, you can think about that as breaking this down to three different models, okay? And really I'm getting in this idea of how do we think about associations replicating across populations, right? And so the first scale, is this, the first model is this idea of a SNP model, right? The same uh, mutations are, are associated for a given trait across all individuals, right? The second is this idea of a gene model. Um, and the gene model says that maybe the core genes are the same across different groups, right? But, they, but in those core genes, they have different associations on the SNP level. Okay, and the last is a pathway model, and the pathway says that uh, you know genes may differ across different groups. So I might have associated genes that are different, but each of those genes between these two groups all can all be mapped or annotated to the same pathway, right? So on this like kind of functional level, that's where replication happens, right? And you can think about different traits where di each of these models may be true on some to some scales across different populations, right? And so what we did recently in, an, in a recent AJC paper is uh, we looked at this. So we took large scale analyses in over 600,000 individuals spanning across different groups of different ancestries, um, across different uh, biobanks and databases and consortia, uh, all of the different uh, sample sizes. And we looked at this idea of replication. Well, not we, what I really mean is Sam Smith <laughs> looked at this idea of uh, when does, uh, when can I expect replication to happen on the SNP level, the gene level, or more on this kind of idea of a pathway based level. 
right? Um, and so here's some cool, interesting results from that. So what you're seeing here is this idea of replication. Uh, proportional replication means I ran my model on the on a group of people of self-identified European ancestry, and I asked myself, and what, how many times does that SNP replicate across other groups? Um, so we do that for a variant level test. We also do that for a gene level test using this method called Genie uh, that uh, a student Wei Cheng uh, developed in uh, mine and Sohini's groups. And we also thought about this idea of what if I took the gene boundaries and I expanded them a little bit so I look at this more of like clumps along the genome and how often would I see uh, a replication occur? And you can see as, a, as I kind of expand my scope or move up in scale, that proportion of replication kind of goes up, right? Um, what's really interesting about this is you can think about multi-scale modeling as a way to give you more resolution on a uh, phenotypic or in genetic architecture, right? Um, so here's a quick example from uh, triglyceride levels, where if I take the genes that uh, we identified in, in one run from this particular cohort, I can then do something like a network analysis to figure out how those genes are uh, connected to each other, right? And here we use this method called HotNet to do this. What I can then do is overlay this with other groups, and I can start to see pieces of where that genetic architecture are both shared and where they are, are, are different. And I can do this in, and continue to expand on many different uh, levels, right? And this kind of gives me a really nice viewpoint of, uh, of, for this particular trait, things that might be shared across different groups and things that not. But here at this pathway level, I really get that type of resolution. Um, you might be asking in, in this study, you know, each of these groups that I've listed here have different sample sizes. And, you know, one nice thing about uh, uh, gene level methods, at least, is that when you aggregate over SNP level uh, associations, you have more power even at low sample sizes, right? So here's a quick simulation of how this how this looks. So here we take, uh, a, and, you know, we have narrow sense heritability a little, a little smaller. I have two different populations of different sample sizes. And here we're seeing the power I have to identify um, uh, the, the causal variants and the causal genes in this, uh, in this simulation. For lowly heritable traits, I may still be underpowered, where the people of African ancestry, self-identified African ancestry, were I think 7,000. And here we had about 30,000 people of European ancestry in this run. But as I move up in inheritability, you can see I still continue to get much more resolution as I think about the proportions of SNPs that are shared between those two groups, right? And so gene level methods will give you a little bit more uh, 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 flexibility in how we think about how we take information uh, from uh, the, the, again, the populations that I have access to today in, my, in these biobanks. And so really why I'm here is to think about this kind of framework, but think about building methods that allow us to get this type of information. And so that's where machine learning comes in. Um, and so my group really thinks a lot about this idea of building interpretable and multiple uh, multi-scale machine learning methods for diverse G losses. Um, this work I'm going to show today was done by uh, two uh, brilliant Brown PhD students, Pinar and Wei, and as well as uh, Hugh, who is now an MD PhD student at U Chicago, but was an RA with me at MSR. And so if we go back to this method or this linear model for uh, association mapping and prediction, you know, there's one key thing that everyone to, to take note here, other than this idea of the beta J's, these beta J's are what make this model interpretable, right? Um, but this model is a little restricted, right? Uh, these X betas assume this like linear relationship of SNPs and their weights in order to give uh, uh, association on this phenotype of interest Y, right? So my group looks to break that and we work with what we call black box methods. And you heard about a little bit about this this morning, right? Um, so machine learning models are, are typically well suited for prediction based tasks. I think that's something that we all can agree on. Um, and when we say that things are black box, what we effectively mean is that um, we have some algorithm, we put some inputs into that algorithm, um, and then out comes some outputs, but I have no idea of what that model is doing inside in order to have like my really nice predictions at the end, right? And so my research goal effectively is to provide interpretable ways to summarize what's happening in the context of that box, right? Um, and for me, my inputs are genotypes and for us our outputs are gonna be phenotypes. Now, why do I wanna work so hard in this regime? Well, because black box methods allow me to see the entire picture, okay? So linear models, as, as even though they're interpretable, you only see a piece of that variation pi, right? I miss out on that nonlinear piece, that piece that I care about that's gonna complete that, that mm -hmm. circle. Black box methods allow me to see the entire piece of the pi, but I, get, I lose interpretability on that side. So what we do is we try to build models on the right that still gonna give us that interpretability that we get on the left, okay? 
Now you might think like, what makes an interpretable statistical model? Um, well, I would break that down into three different components, okay? There's some underlying motivating probabilistic model. Um, each, of that, each input for that, for that, each feature in, my, in that model, I can derive a notion of an effect size or, or a regression coefficient. And then I have some statistical metric that's gonna allow me to summarize the significance of each of those features, right? So I don't just have weights, I have a way to put some kind of statistical uh, significance on those weights, okay? Um, now, I'm, in this talk, I think we have today, these are a myriad of different uh, uh, um, black box statistical methods that you could use. But we're gonna focus here on neural networks for a little bit. Um, and I like to say, and I think I saw this from Andy Kern, that, that uh, uh, neural networks and machine learning is just fancy linear algebra. So I hope I also demystify this method a little bit uh, as we talk about this. So the inputs of these features here are gonna be our SNPs. So let's just assume we have uh, SNP1 and SNP2. Um, this is going to what we call a fully connected network, which effectively means that every single input variable, right, is connected to a, a node in the next layer, right? So that's what we call fully connected. Well, what's really nice about this is I can rewrite this model, which is a fully connected neural network, as just like a nonlinear regression method, right? So uh, uh, you could think about uh, x and its inputs. The sum of x and its inputs are going to be fed into this H, which we call a, a hidden neuron, right? That H model is then going to take that summation and do some nonlinear transformation to it. And then I'm going to take those H's, those new nonlinear H's, add them with their new weights. And then that's just going to give me my prediction Y, right? It's just a nonlinear, like hierarchical model, basically. Now we call this not interpretable because I can run this method, but there's no real notion of an effect size here or, or a weight or regression coefficient, right? There's no real way to understand how X1 and X2 are related to this F output. Right, and that's why we heard a, a, a version of a talk today where you can think about interpretability here, here a few ways. So I can figure out significance by saying, okay, what if I perturbed X1 in some way that then I might lose predictability and that will tell me that X1 is important to my prediction. That was, that was kind of the flavor of the stuff that we heard today. Um, you can think about other types of methods as well where, where uh, machine learning uh, 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 researchers have thought about ways where um, you can think about the information loss if I if I were to uh, drop out certain uh, weights in the model, but all these kind of methods don't really kind of structure with those three things I talked about, and none of those methods get at this notion of a null hypothesis, which is really important in our space for uh, physical genetics because that's how we control type one error rates, right? And so my group has been figuring out ways to play with that architecture in a way. And one way you could think about doing this is self-imposing biological annotations on the way that we think the model should learn, right? So instead of doing these post hoc methods I mentioned, I can use what I know about biology and the hierarchical nature of, of genetic studies in order to say, I'm gonna force the model only to learn what I think is possible. So here we have a Manhattan plot. And what's really nice about this is I, not only do I know SNP lo or locations for each uh, loci in my data set, but I also have some kind of annotations for which genes are in those regions, right? So for all enrichment studies, what I actually have is I have a, I can have a list of annotations that are readily available to me and I also know like the genomic positions of where these, uh, where these genes lie, the chromosomes, their starting in positions, and the SNPs that fall within those windows, right? Now, some of you may know that I've been thinking about how to do this from a biologically annotated structure. So for those who don't, stick with me really quickly. Um, if you're looking at this from the way it's structured, um, SNPs are feeding into genes, right? Now, if I rotate this on its axis, SNPs are feeding into genes that looks just like a neural network, just partially connected where I don't have a fully connected model anymore. I only allow connections to happen if the annotations say that they should happen. So here I have a SNP to gene to phenotype model now where SNPs are only connected to the next hidden layer if they've been annotated for the same gene. Um, and now this makes my model fully interpretable, right? My first layer now has a meaning. The hidden layer now is however I've annotated my data set and I have regression on my phenotype, okay? And these are what biologically annotated networks are or bands as we call them. So bands, you just start with some kind of uh, annotation set. You know the start and end position of the chromosome, uh, uh, where they're located, and you know which SNPs fall on that uh, within those windows. You can take that annotation and turn it into what we call a partially connected neural model. Now, again, this is like a hierarchical method. You can think about this, again, as a nonlinear model. Uh, so what we could do here is we could now start to think about how I think effects are distributed on different genomic scales all at once, right? So let's imagine that I think I'm falling under this regime where I have very sparse or, or non-zero effects. I can have the weights of my model fall on a natural spike and style prior. 
I can do the same thing if I think the distributions are a little bit more um, uh, uh, different and interesting. I can fit these with a, a mixture prior as well. Um, and bands really gives you that kind of flexibility. And again, the, the point here is that you can model this with, again, this nice nonlinear structure. What's nice about this is an integrative approach, right? In my training of this model, as I learn which SNPs are important, I, that also informs what genes are important and vice versa, right? So you allow the layers and the scales to like learn from each other. Um, we've been working on bands for quite a while. Uh, bands now is now uh, pretty flexible. It works also with summary statistics and you can also model it now using multiple phenotypes. So if you wanna learn across different traits, you can also do that in bands. Um, and so, you know, the points about bands is that it uses like this variational EM in order to fit the weights in the model. Um, really importantly, the weights of non-associated SNPs and genes are gonna to go to zero. Um, and the, the point is that bands then gives you an inclusion probability that tells you how important each of those SNPs and genes are. So you get simultaneous inference all at once, right? And so band structure really covers the entire thing that I was talking about before. It really starts with a prob motivating probabilistic model. Each weight, it gives you a notion of an effect size for either your SNPs or your SNP sets. And then those posterior inclusion probabilities really give you this idea of a statistical significance symmetry. Um, and also band provides a, that multi-scale view that I was talking about before. Um, so just really quickly to show you how this works in practice, um, here we're gonna take chromosome one from individuals of uh, your self-identified European ancestry and UK biobank. Um, we're going to have uh, 394,000 individuals on that chromosome. We have about 36,000 SNPs after, uh, after doing quality control, 1,900 genes. And effectively, one metric of bands will be that if it's doing its job, it should rank SNPs better than the best methods, and it should rank SNP sets better than the best methods, right? And so that's kind of what you see in this, in this space for both sparse and polygenic architectures. Bands is, is great at identifying causal SNPs. And it's also great at identifying core genes as well. Um, there's some things that we want to improve, like the runtime of bands, but the, the framework itself, uh, we, we're really happy with. Um, you might be asking, do, neural, do, do nonlinear models actually really matter? The answer is yes, they do. So here in this ablation test of additive effects, um, we took away parts of bands to figure out if the nonlinear piece really mattered. So for additive effects, it really doesn't. The power for bands stays the same. But if I had simulated traits with epistasis or something, you can see that the power of bands starts to drop when I remove that nonlinear component. Um, in real data, you also kind of get these nice uh, summaries. Um, so here I'm going to show you some results from both the Framingham Heart Study and the UK Biobank um, on, on HDL. Um, and these are the kind of summaries you can make with bands. So you can also get not only an idea of mapping on the SNP level, but bands will also tell you in conjunction with that, which SNP sets are really important. So you can, again, do these like really nice multi-scale summaries. Now, my, my goal here today was to show you that neural networks are really nice tools and that you can use these with anything that you, uh, anything you want. So you can also use uh, neural networks for fine mapping tasks as well. Um, so let's say I go back to my, my fully connected model. Um, again, I just have a hierarchical model. You can do things like with Suzy, where Suzy makes credible sets for, uh, um, for fine mapping tasks. You can do similar things in neural networks where I can set up single effect priors uh, in my models. Again, get inclusion probabilities. This setup yields the same three checks that I need before, right? I have a probabilistic model, I have an effect size weight for my inputs. Um, and in this prior, what this prior does is say, if I'm gonna knock out SNP one, I take away all of its weights as well, right? So there's nice interpretability and you get inclusion probabilities here. Um, these types of strategies lead to, lead to the same kind of uh, uh, models that you would think about for, from a nonlinear perspective. And so you have nice, really well calibrated uh, inclusion probabilities. Um, and actually for, for fine mapping tasks for which your uh, single SNPs have like dominance effects, you can see how much better uh, a neural network might be than, the, than classical SUSE. Um, um, and so that I just kind of want to close with future work um, really quickly. So, you know, the things that we're thinking about in my group and hopefully we'll continue to think about this is, um, you know, by testing a for associations at multiple scales, um, you know, multi-ancestry GWAS can generate biologically uh, interpretable hypotheses. Um, you know, in this whole genome sequencing world, I think we should continue to, uh, to unify uh, prediction and association uh, based methods. Um, and really this idea of generalizing interpretable machine learning methods uh, 
both allow you to work with like multiple omics data sources as well as be amenable to uh, things with small sample sizes, which is really nice. Um, right before we take any questions, I think I'm right on time. Um, I do want to point out that uh, as we continue to work in multi ancestry studies, um, you know, we sh should all continue to be really careful about how we describe our different populations. I think there are many people in the space that are doing incredible work, including in this room. Um, you know, I think what we've, uh, you know, I've been working on this space of thinking about uh, ways of, of not mixing ethnicity and race. And um, I just want to say that uh, I've been proud of this community and that we as, as, a, as a group should continue to work across uh, lines uh, and work together to come to consensus on best terms to use. Uh, so with that, I'll close and say, uh, this is a combination of working with a lot of people um, and yeah, people give us money. So thanks for listening, appreciate it. Oh, and here's some relevant resources, sorry. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Shreyas from Harvard. A really great talk. A uh, question I had, uh, you brought up the nonlinear effects early on and you're able to like see that they're important, like as like the all the nonlinear effects are kind of important, but were you able to like specifically map some nonlinear effects like pair, cases of pairwise and like third order? Emphasis? Yeah, yeah, great question. So not in this model. So yeah, so this is, this is a really good point. So what bands, what bands will do is say, I'm going to think about your additive effects and nonlinear effects all together, right? So, uh, it doesn't, it can't tease them apart. So if you're gonna run it, if you would have, we, we have to think about another way to do this. So what bands will do is get an encoding probability that's gonna take about the enrichment over all those effects kind of summed together. But if you really wanna think about, okay, which part of that was additivity and which part of that was non-additivity, it can't give you that kind of resolution. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Ryan Gunkoons from Arizona. And I, I really like the injection of more biology into these machine learning methods. and. It wasn't quite clear to me. Do you have a single layer representing the genes? And if that's the case, would, would more depth there let you represent pathways or yeah. other sorts of sort of systems biology type interactions? Yeah, genes? exactly. Okay, great question. So um, you can, so you can make it a, a, a deeper model. You can think about different ways to not just do genes. You can think about uh, other types of annotations you might, uh, in your first layer, you can extend it to say, I want to extend towards like local pathways and then more, uh, 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 larger pathways, so you can make the model much deeper. Um, we stopped in this paper at genes because we couldn't do any more <laughs> simulations. Um, <laughs> but you're but you're right. You you could think about ways uh, to expand this for which would give you much more uh, um, like different granularity on those different scales. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, we haven't tried that. One thing I will say though is if your annotations are too large, such that they're too inclusive, you could have an identifiability problem where. Um, uh, if if you have very large annotations that are very highly overlapping, such that they look like they're sharing the same information, bands will choose one of those annotations and not the other one in the in the model. So you want to be careful about making your annotations distinct enough so that the model separates them as saying that they're 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 contributing two different sets of information rather than the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, nice, nice talk. Thank. Uh, I'm Xingyi from U Chicago, and I'm wondering, have you? You try to use the multi as uh, multi as ancestry uh, GWAS data and to combine to your uh, band network, and um, that I think can either help us to both either increase the power or also uh, figure out whether the multi ancestry GWAS uh, they have shared the same pathway or share the same gene effect. Yeah, so we haven't done this. Uh, we haven't done a comprehensive study like the first one I showed with bands. Um, that would be the next step. Um, one thing to think about with machine learning in general is a lot of models need a lot of data to learn from. And so um, you would the way that we use a lot of approximations in bands as is currently set up, um, which makes me think if we move to a smaller data regime with as the model fits right now, you may not have enough, a lot of power. So you may want to think about using more of a fully Bayesian thing in that case. Um, but we haven't we haven't tried that yet. But that's that's our like next for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hi, Chris McAllister, UW Madison. Uh, I had a question about the um, um, biological annotations. So I was curious um, how the how you would deal with the situation where there's a lot of causative variants that are in um, highly gene dense regions, but non coding uh, locations or non coding locations that are like very distal to the 
uh, yeah, say whatever they're affecting? Yeah, so that's a great. That's another great question. So one thing you can do in the software right now, um, and there's other features that we can think about adding to this is you can give the model you'll get you give the model a, a, a basically what they with, um, an annotation list so you'll say like which which snips are annotated for which genes and you can give them all the opera the the chance to say um for snips that fall not with necessarily within these annotations but within the middle say the the desert of two genes you can include those as like a, a, another separate node for which you have an annotation and what bands will do similarly to this uh figure i showed here um is it'll spit something out where it's like they'll show the, like that star here as being between two genes, um, or you could say don't include anything that's not annotated. So you give it, you can give it an option um, of of how it will handle uh, those things. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, great talk. So, uh, so you showed that you have improvement of your method over like Susie. So I was wondering how significant is the improvement uh, in reality? I'm like, sorry. For uh, how significant is the improvement in reality? Like for, for example, you you need to do experiments to verify the the identified causal variance, right? Uh, like the the improvement of that, uh, the significance of the improvement in reality. Yeah, uh, you're talking. Are you talking about for for? Yeah, yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it totally, totally depends. Um, so we ran this for two for a bunch of different traits. Uh, for the first trait, I think we had very much comparable things with Susie. So again, it probably depends on whether or not your effects are coming from things that have only additivity or not. So the, the thing about a lot of these machine learning methods is, is if there's no lin there's no nonlinearities, they should kind of converge on what the additive model identifies. And at least that's what we see in this this paper here. Um, we ran this on both humans as well as mice. For some of the mice traits, you did see non-additive variation play a role. And so you did see there's a figure where uh, we look at hits that we identify and then and annotate the hits that Susie kind of missed. And you can map those to things where people have looked at like epistasis in some of these uh, traits. Um, and there's a lot of uh, agreement there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's thank Lauren one more time. And our last speaker before the break uh, is Rafael Guerrero. Uh, we'll be talking about how hybrid incompatibilities agglomerate on gene networks. Hi. Um, thanks to the organizers, to Jeff and Brandon, Jose and uh, Emilia, and everybody at DSA uh, for this uh, invitation. So I'm gonna talk to you about hybrid incompatibilities and how they accumulate. Uh, between diverging lineages through time, which of course means that you're going to get the pleasure of listening to yet another explanation of how Dobson's schemaler incompatibilities work. Uh, so imagine that you have an ancestral population with, say, alleles big A and big B that maybe through some vicarious event becomes two daughter lineages. Those two daughter lineages can then uh, fix alternative alleles that, uh, say, little a and little b that go pretty well in their respective genetic backgrounds, but have not been tested and could go really, really poorly if they come together in a, um, a hybrid, contributing to reproductive isolation between those lineages. In 1995, Alan Orr uh, published his seminal paper entitled uh, Population Genetics of Speciation, colon something, even though there was uh, nothing of population genetic models in that paper, it did include beautiful pictures or illustrations like this one that allows us to uh, clearly and very simply illustrate how as each new substitution appears in the divergent lineages, it can be incompatible with every previous preceding substitution before it. The, the whole paper just relies on this very, very simple uh, figure. And it, it really came up with a lot, a lot of interesting um, intuition and predictions of how speciation should uh, proceed. If you formalize some of that uh, intuition that, uh, that was in, in that original um, or snowball paper, one of the key um, conclusions that you reach is that uh, incompatibilities should accumulate faster than linearly through time. And the, the reason that is that like, if you think about something like a pair of uh, lineages that have K substitutions that are different between them, then the total number of pairs that can be incompatible is roughly K choose two, sorry, K choose two, um, approximately K squared over two, that's the total number of possible pairs. 
And if you assume that each one of those pairs has a probability of incompatibility of P, then you just have to take the product of that to roughly estimate the number of incompatibilities that you expect at that particular time. Of course, if you plot um, the, the number of genetic differences on the x-axis and maybe hope that they're accumulating in a roughly molecular clock, then you're kind of approximating the number of incompatibilities growing uh, quadratically or at least faster than linearly with, with time. Uh, then uh, skip to 2010 when uh, uh, Leonie Moyle and Tak Nakasato pro gave us the best test that we have so far with the, of the snowball effect, and apologies to Daniel Matute, of course. Um, they they uh, took a, Q, a QTL approach with in three pairs of species of tomato and it, its relatives, and two uh, fitness components. Uh, seed fertility, that is the number of seeds that an individual is uh, producing, and pollen viability measured as uh, the fraction of pollen grains that are deemed viable by some staining assay that I won't really that I, that's the extent of my knowledge of it, actually. Um, that, so what you can see there is that when they tried to correlate the genetic distance to uh, the number of sterility loci, so number of QTL that had individual effects on sterility for each one of these components, they saw a quadratic effect on the seed side, but a rather linear effect on the pollen side. And yes, I'm aware those are only three points, but as I said, this is the best we have so far. My question to that, of course, is where are the missing incompatibilities? What, what are we missing in, the, in this picture? Um, I, I guess to make any progress, we had to go back to uh, thinking about the core of the snowball model and kind of revise the assumptions that that small, snowball model was making to see if there's anything that is being violated. All right. So, it's actually a pretty simple model. I walked through it. Really, I wasn't simplifying it all that much and there's a single slide. The main thing is the probability of incompatibility P is very, very small and is it's constant through time. And that the genome is very big. That is essentially it's an infinite sites model. There are kind of a couple, a couple, a couple of corollaries uh, that stem from those assumptions. One is that the, each locus participates in a single DMI, meaning as Leone and Tak Nakasato did was, if, if you count loci, you can assume that each one of the uh, sterility loci represents one half of a, DM, a pairwise DMI. And uh, kind of similarly, DMIs have independent effects on reproductive isolation, meaning like if all of these pairs are somewhere spread throughout the genome, but don't really see each other, they're kind of contributing a little bit to reproductive isolation. Oh. And I press the... Nuke button. Um, and so, right. Um, right. So, what, what I want to say there to the second corollary is I'm not going to dive too much into how reproductive isolation actually works, but I will say that it has led, that, that particular corollary has led to misinterpretations, let's call them, of thinking that reproductive isolation should snowball. But that is not the case because not all the MIs have, the, some, have similar uh, fitness effects, yada, yada. Reproductive isolation does not snowball. Anyway, with uh, having this kind of question in mind of where, is, where are the missing incompatibilities, uh, uh, we collaborated with Leonie Moyle, shown here threatening me with uh, Sparkler, um, and kind of went back to the hybrids and took. Um, kind of empirical approach to this question of where, where the incompatibilities are. So we wanted to evaluate the phenotypes of pairwise combinations of introgression. So we used a library of nils shown in your bottom left there. It's basically a collection of hybrids that are mostly uh, Solanum lycopersicum, so uh, domesticated tomato, but they have little chunks of the genome of another species, Solanum uh, hybrocades, uh, introgressed in it. So we can have like a representation of the whole genome in homozygote form the whole genome of one species on the other background. So we took pairs of those nils and we put them together into bills, so double intergression lines. And we used, we phenotyped both the nil parents and these bill uh, daughter lines, say the double intergression lines and compare their phenotypes with respect to the expectation that we'd have uh, based on say an ad additive effects of each one of these intergress loci. And uh, using these like expect versus observed, 
uh, phenotypic effects, we inferred interactions or kind of higher order epistatic in interactions between introgressed loci. We did that for 15 uh, different introgression lines, producing a total of 95 uh, double introgression lines. So not, actually not all of them were successful. Uh, I'm going to present the results like this in this circular network fashion. A little dot is a single introgressed locus. If it's gray, there wasn't a significant effect on sterility, like independently when it was introgressed on its own. And if it's red, it has an individual effect on sterility. And we did this for, uh, again, the, the same two fitness components, seed fertility and pollen viability, or well, maybe it should have said viability there. And then I'm going to draw an edge between two dots, between two nodes, to represent that there was a significant epistatic interaction between them. These are the results. Uh, we found that the network for seed fertility seems pretty sparse in comparison to the pollen fertility, right? So whereas in, in, in the seed side, we have maybe a pair up there and maybe one third order, so three little components together there and a fourth uh, kind of Oh, sorry, a third uh, cluster of four um, in intragress loci interacting together. On the other hand, we have pollen fertility being a hairball of 10 intragress loci that could have some combination of, inter uh, of epistatic interactions. I mean, yes, you could kind of imagine in a very exaggerated way that this is a 10th order DMI uh, or like a 10th order complex DMI. Um, the reality is we do not have the resolution to know exactly what are what, what's happening there. But I do think that it is um, compelling enough uh, data to suggest that um, these corollaries of the assumption of the, the or, or corollaries that derive from the assumptions of the snowball model are not quite being met. That is, I think we showed that these loci participate probably in more than one DMI, more than one DMI, at least if we interpret DMIs as just pairwise DMIs, and that DMIs do not have independent effects on reproductive isolation, mostly because if there are complexes or like pairs of DMIs that are coming together, then they're likely not going to be acting on it on their own um, to you know con contributing to reproductive isolation on their own. All right, so I, I wanted to take this. Uh, kind of for a kind of theoretical spin, so to speak, I wanted to revisit how robust the original snowball model was to these potential violations. And specifically we wanted, and this is in collaboration with Evgeny Brood, my postdoc whose face should be up here. I'm sorry about that, Evgeny, he's around. Um, for the probability of incompatibility is not very small. So I wanna play, we wanna play around with uh, the, values of P, and we want to play around with a model that allows us to have multiple substitutions per locus, maybe because we're thinking that in the best case scenario, we have maybe the possibility of introgressing a full gene and capture incompatibilities or rather interactions between genes, but we're not quite at the level of resolution where we can explore interactions between amino acid substitutions, like individual amino acid substitutions. Um, and so because we're interested in kind of building that type of model, we're gonna take a gene network approach. We're gonna build a simulation. We have a little bit of analytical results that we're not gonna show you today, but um, essentially we're gonna allow uh, hybrid incompatibilities to evolve in a, in a finite gene network. All right, this is a almost embarrassing, embarrassingly simple uh, simulation, not the slide, this is the description. Um, so if you imagine that there's an underlying gene network, instead of thinking about how gene networks uh, diverge themselves, I'm gonna think about the gene network, the ancestral gene network as being the, the thing that allows, right, the thing on which, onto which incompatibilities arise. So this is this underlying feature that on, onto which we can draw basically the little pairs. So from that, we're gonna start with basically a cloud of disconnected dots. And we're gonna to start to like put mutations in each one of those nodes and each one of those loci and uh, have them have with probability P some incompatibility, right? So the first one of course is not incompatible with anything, but by the second one, you have a single edge with P 
Second one, you have two Ps. And then maybe with some luck, you have one realized DMI. So we record that in something that we're calling the resulting incompatibility network, which is not more, not much more than just a subgraph of the underlying gene network. We keep going for a while, of course, hundreds of steps here. Uh, maybe we start to collect other DMIs in this particular case, then like we have two edges representing two pairwise DMIs. And throughout our simulation, we're going to be recording three particular quantities of interest. Uh, num the, the number of nodes that are involved in compatibility. So uh, we can call also like what, what we are, sorry, what I have been calling sturdily loci. The number of edges that represent pairwise incompatibilities and the number of incompatibility clusters. So that, those are connected components in the resulting incompatibility network. Of course, if, so here we have two clusters, two edges, four nodes. If there was a single new edge in this particular cartoon, we would, we would end up having three edges, but only one connected cluster, right? And we're gonna call this phenomenon the agglomeration of pairwise DMIs. So like this is similar to what um, Ata Calirad and Ricardo Acevedo were calling complexification. All right, before I show you the results of their simulations, I wanna stop and think a little bit about what the value of P should be. Right. So in 2002, uh, Torelli and Orr argued by using interspecific crosses, mostly under Sofala. I think there were some Bombina examples there. Right? Like they had detected a handful of DMIs and there were estimated tens of thousands of amino acid substitutions between these species that P should be on the order of 10 to the negative six. If they were a little bit generous with their interpretation, maybe they said, okay, all the way up to 10 to the negative four, but it is clear that the genome-wide P should be very, very tiny. Now, I think that the kind of epistasis pendulum has swung in the opposite direction. A lot of people are seeing epistasis all over. I think it is less controversial to say that negative epistatic interactions are pretty common across the genome. I'm not saying that it's going to be all the way 10 to the negative two over here, but I think that there is, especially in the context of the results that we showed from tomato, that maybe it is the case that the probability of incompatibility of different substitutions or fixed differences is a little bit higher than that. I have two points here to kind of remind myself that it is not only me who's like sticking my neck out and saying that this is crazy, uh, crazy high probability interaction. There's the RNA folding model that I just mentioned at the Calirada and Ricardo Acevedo. They simulated how RNA folds and that the probability of incompatibility of different, different amino acid substitutions actually changes a little bit through time, but it's roughly 2%. And actually a little bit of an exaggerated uh, example here, if you take the Costanzo data that uh, we heard about um, recently in this, in, in this conference. So the, the library of double mutants in yeast is 23 million pairs out of which roughly 2% of them ended up having negative epistatic interactions. So I'm not saying that every substitution will lead to a knockout, but it kind of definitely suggests that P could be a little bit higher. All of this just to justify that I'm gonna show you results for three cases of P that are between 10 to negative four and five times 10 to negative three. I just in my low, mid, and high, this is that where I'm interested in. Um, I'm not interested in the lower end of that because I'm going to tell you right away, this is essentially Orr's model. We're like interested in how this parameter is affecting like the failure of, or like the, when, sorry, when P does not meet the assumptions of, the, of Orr's model. All right, so how does this parameter affect the snowball? I'm going to show you the results in uh, these three panels. This is, this is not the results, this is, Kind of the blank uh, panels. These are for com a complete network. So this is a network in which there is a, an edge for every pair of nodes. The node is all nodes are connected to each other, and the dashed line is the expectation from that quadratic uh, form that uh, that quadratic form that um, Eleanor had in '95. And this these arrows is just to remind us, or to remind myself, to tell you that in according to that model, the number of DMI pairs, or pairwise DMIs and the number of clusters should be the same because all clusters are pairs. And um, just for the sake of simplicity of these pictures, I've divided by two the number of sterility loci that is expected. So of course, if everything is a pair, then the number of sterility loci should be twice the number of pairs, but I've divided that number by two so that everything fits in there. 
All right, these are the actual results. If P is tensor negative four, we're still very, very close to uh, kind of Eleanor domain here, right? So patterns and clusters and sterility loci all track each other pretty well. They're all good proxies for the snowball effect. And the lower bottom left there, I'm kind of showing you a cartoon of what is roughly happening. So each pair is its own little cluster. But as you increase, as we increase the probability of incompatibility, so in the panels in the middle and the, on the right, then you have a decoupling of those measures. And the decoupling is basically a, a, a result of this agglomeration pattern that I, I was trying to hint at before. Right? So while uh, the pairs continue to, to, to accumulate in a quadratic way, then those in, start to be, be connected and become larger and larger clusters of complex DMI. So it, the, 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 the snowball kind of the, the, the implication here is that the snowball is not at risk at the pairwise level, but if all you have to look for in your particular species or pair species of interest is clusters, for example, or even sterility loci, you might not see a snowball effect. And of course, I think that, um, well, this is squinting, there's no data fitting so far, but I think that the results of those simulations are pretty consistent with what we had been seeing in, in Solana, meaning when Leoni Moyo and Takna Kasato did the QTL, the QTL stuff that is like the panels in gray, they found that there was a linear increase in sterility loci that, the, that is like sterility loci in pollen were not snowballing. And it is consistent with that kind of mess of a hairball that maybe suggests that the probability of incompatibility is pretty high, or maybe that the evolutionary rate of uh, pollen is, is much higher than for seed. All right, so I have a little animation here just to allow me to do a little, maybe not. Oh yeah, um, just because I, I wanted to drink water and I didn't bring the water. So, um, so this, is a, this is just one iteration of this simulation. Um, you will notice that the network that I'm doing this on is not a complete network. This is actually a scale free network which we think, or many people have found, is pretty, are, are a pretty common topology in biological networks. And in this one instance of the simulation, we have the accumulation of maybe four, sorry, three or four big clumps of like four loci each, and then a bunch of little pairs, right? So there's definitely a little bit of accumulation of agglomeration there, but it begs, and it doesn't beg the question, but I want, <laughs> I wanted to explore how uh, the topology of the network, if we move away from that complete network framework, uh, how would affect the, the snowball effect and specifically the agglomeration pattern, right? In other words, how does network topology affect the snowball? And I'm gonna do that by um, comparing three different networks. I already kind of introduced you to the complete network, com fully connected network. I already told you a little bit about the scale-free network. It is a network in which the degree distribution, that is the number of connectors, the, the, the distribution of number of connections per node follows a power law, which results essentially in most nodes having one or two connections and then a few nodes being hubs, very highly connected. And you can really see that in the, in the graphic representation. And then a third uh, network called the small world, right uh, there in the middle, in which every node has roughly the same, well, there's a little bit of perturbation, but roughly the same number of connections. And in this particular case, I think each one of these has five or six uh, edges. So it does, doesn't have the variation, but it also is not the hyper-connected one that the complete network is. All right, here's uh, how the snowball changes by topology. I have here the title that like, it's a minor effect, but I think it's underselling it. I, the, the, the edges definitely do not show a very strong effect. I think that that's pretty, uh, I, I expected that in a way, right? Like an edge is an edge in any network. And so you're accumulating pairs at a quadratic rate, no big deal there. There's very, very little differences, very few differences, but, in the, but there are some differences in the number of clusters and the size of the clusters that uh, the, each network kind of produces, right? So we have that the small world 
stays closer to the 95 expectation and that scale free networks, not surprisingly, tend to cluster a little bit more, right? They, they form clusters faster, they agglomerate faster. Uh, and complete in this particular case is a little bit in the middle. But, uh, I'll, I think that, that those patterns that I'm trying to suggest that I'm trying to hint at are better seen in other kind of features or like other quantities that we can capture in the, in the incompatibility network. Those two are the maximum degree of, of the serially loci, that, that is the number of connections that one serial locus tends to have or the, the, the biggest, the highest connection of the high, highest leak on that, oh shit. But, but yeah, very highly connected uh, locus tends to have. So it's scale free keeps growing, of course, because hubs have so many available connections that like you, you just, the, that degree keeps growing, while small world kind of tends to saturate and does not keep growing. And the, the other one would be, the other measure that we're interested in right now is the maximum size of the cluster. So how big, how, how big is the order of the complex DMI that you're forming? And in a similar way, the scale free, which is the tall one there, uh, keeps growing while small world uh, is a little bit, grows a lot slower. And then complete has, the, the complete network has this kind of odd, almost quadratic shape there that we haven't really explored much. And we, we're kind of working on how to summarize these results better. And we're, so far we've come up with something called a agglomeration index in which if, if it's zero, everything is a pairwise DMI. And if it's one, everything is a single blob. And these types of indices have, or this index has allowed us to really, really tease apart the patterns between all those three topologies. And we hope to continue to explore, to potentially uh, use this later in like some sort of data fitting. Although don't ask me further because that's very, very vague in my head right now. Um, okay, so in sum, uh, I told you today about how um, DMIs are snowballing in Solanum, as long as you see them as pairwise DMIs that the snowball effect is robust to the probability of incompatibility being high and infinite sites being violated as long as we're discussing the snowball as pairwise DMIs and do not think about clusters or complex DMIs, that thing, th those measures are under many circumstances break breaking, like are not snowballing. And that network topology matters a little bit for pairwise DMIs, but matters a lot for the shape of the clusters, the number of clusters, the size of the clusters that are being produced by these agglomeration patterns. So some closing thoughts, just to remind everybody, or especially people that might be thinking about working this in the field or in the lab, Serially loci are not good proxies for numbers of DMIs. I think we, I, I showed that in our results. The snowball of number of DMIs depends largely, largely depends on P, which I argued um, is a parameter we do not have any good handle on. I, I, I don't think that the Torelli and Orr uh, approximations are particularly good, but I'm, I don't think that I gave you a very good alternative to them. Um, a complex hybrid incompatibilities probably start forming early in the divergence process. And by that, I mean probably much earlier than most of us are comfortable with. Uh, very, very early nascent species might be having uh, clusters that we wouldn't expect. And uh, just to harp a little bit more on this, reproductive isolation still doesn't snowball. And even worse with my results, I don't think it, snowball, it, it, it snowballs even less because if I'm telling you that a lot of these things agglomerate pretty early, then they tend to interact very early. Therefore, they probably have diminishing returns or some sort of other interactions that mean that reproductive isolation is not being accumulated in a normal kind of quadratic fashion. All right, with that, I'm going to... Uh, thank Evgeny, who is whose picture is here, and uh, of course Leonie Moyle and Chris Muir and Sarah Jogwe were the uh, co-authors in the first part. Evgeny had a, a poster uh, here about extending the model that we talked about today, but with m modifying the weights of how we pick the nodes, which we can use as a kind of proxy for differential rates of evolution that we can kind of sort of think about as uh, purifying selection in some genes. Uh, so I encourage you to go and talk to him or look for his poster online if you're interested in that kind of stuff. All right. Thank you very much.
John Willis, Duke University. That was a great talk. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. There's no population genetics in Alan Orr's original paper. And um, in, in fact, what you're talking about here are fixations that are basically clock-like neutral substitutions. But yet a lot of dobjansky muller um, loci appear to have evolved due to positive selection, probably very episodic and unpredictable in their rate of accumulation. So I'm wondering, um, you've been seeking to see under what conditions you have a snowball or not under this neutral substitution model, but um, isn't it just simpler to think you may not get a snowball just because things are not substituting in a neutral fashion? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, so what I was trying to hint at with uh, Evgeny's uh, kind of extension, adding this potential purifying selection is uh, rather that we think that we, we can kind of impose different mutation regimes per node. And you can think about that as some genes having positive selection and some genes being you know under purifying selection. Uh, what we found, and this is kind of spoiling his poster from yesterday, uh, is that um, as long as these differential rates of evolution are not very highly correlated with things like degree or levels of connectivity in the network itself, it kind of averages out. So I wouldn't be too worried because even if a few genes are kind of under positive selection, the kind of network as a whole couldn't be just like, I mean, if it's, if it's the case, then I would imagine it is more like a, kind of like what I think is happening in pollen. And like the tomato pollen thing is like, maybe evolution is making it go really fast. And so what the, the, the main effect is basically we're kind of further out in this x-axis, like we go faster in the x-axis, but the snowball should still be there. I, um, my question is, uh, uh, so what do you think, which network topology feature is important for predicting the fitness cost of hybrids? Like, what do you think it scales with a number of edges or the number of loci? Like, I mean, obviously, like it's a diminishing return thing because you can't be deader than dead, but. Well. It, it is diminishing returns, I think, on edges more than loci, I would, I would argue. Yes. But I mean, this is out of my uh, some intuition, let's call it. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a quick question. So you showed that we get bigger clusters in scale-free networks. Um, have you looked at the topology of the clusters themselves? Okay. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Have you looked at the topology of the bigger clusters in scale-free uh, uh, networks themselves? So what, what is the topology? Right, so yeah, that's kind of part of the goal with this uh, index of agglomeration that I kind of hinted at a little bit. We want to explore feature topological features of these big clusters just kind of as i can be what what i didn't talk about this of course but we do end up having like crazy clusters like this in certain circumstances and um and and they and they can be a very different uh they can have different very different shapes i actually don't know what the biological implication would be for that but it could be fun for whenever in the future we get the type of data that could be fit to this thanks Let's thank Raphael again, but right, please. Thanks. And if you'll please stick around for a few more minutes, I'll get the. Let's see. Okay. Um, so I'll first start off with the poster awards slide. Uh, poster awards. I'd like to thank the. Uh, postdoc uh, committees that did the hard work of going through hundreds of posters and choosing nominations for the awards. Um, and I'll ask the poster awardees to come up and we'll give them a round of applause for the undergraduate awards. Uh, if, if you could if you could please come up on stage and get your award. The first is Rachel Eder for their work on gene regulatory response to protein misfolding. And the second place, Doran Goldman for their work on uh, inoculation dose of colonization success in gut microbiomes. Yeah, thank you. All right.
Um, and then we have as well our graduate student uh, poster awardees. Um, we first have Elena Romero for their work on viral load uh, and intra-host recombination in, in HIV. Um, Mikey Morrison for um, FST-based tools for ancestry variability. Uh, and uh, Tusa Samani for their work on genetic architecture of rolling behavior in pigeons. So they could please come up. And I, I think, uh, like everyone I talked to, um, I was super impressed by the science of the Crow Awardee session. Um, so all of these people gave wonderful talks and it was really, really great science. So we could give all of them a round of applause, please. Um, I'd like to thank also uh, Brett Pysour and the Crow Award Committee because I wouldn't want to have had to make the choice uh, among these great candidates, um, but we did make, or they did make a choice. And I'd like to award the 2022 Crow Award finalist to Eileen McPherson. Oh. Okay, uh, with that, please come back at 3.20 and we'll finish up uh, the last of the session chair sessions. Oh, my Thank you. 
There's a recommendation of like not having a kind of problem content. You know, the problem content uh kind of having a few of the work that we look at on how much But then there's a few of the things that you can do to the problem. Yeah, so you can tell me what you're doing with it. It's a good thing to do with it.
Um, if we could settle down and try to get started so we can stay on time. Um, welcome to the, the very last uh, session. We have three more talks from our session chairs. Our first talk is by Priya Mordani, uh, who will be speaking about the timing and causes of evolution of human germline mutation spectrum. So please help me in welcoming Priya. Thanks everyone for staying until the end. I wanted to give you all a minute to catch your breath before we get started. So it's a real pleasure to share my lab's work on uh, trying to study the evolution of germline mutation rates with you. Uh, germline mutation rates are a fundamental parameter in all our studies. In fact, they're so important that the earliest estimates of mutation rate date back to 19. Uh, 30s by Haldane, when it was not even appreciated that DNA is uh, the uh, source of heritable material. Let me see if you can see. Now, in the past uh, decade, there have been a number of studies on genome sequencing that have really fundamentally changed the way we think about mutagenesis. There are large data sets now that are available of uh, pedigrees uh, for uh, data among uh, populations and also data across species. And these data are really helping us uh, understand more precisely how mutations occur. Now, the most direct way to understand, uh, to measure uh, germline mutations is to sequence the pedigrees. So you can sequence the genome of the father and the mother uh, and uh, the offspring, and then directly ask in one generation how many mutations occur. In doing so, what we learn is that there are about 70 new mutations that occur in one generation. The mutation rate in humans is really low. It's 1.2 times 10 to the minus 8 per base pair per generation. And then consistent with models of spermatogenesis, where the spermatogonial cells continuously divide uh, post-puberty, we, we see that uh, there is an increase in the number of mutations with the age of the father. Surprisingly, we also see that there is a significant effect of the mother's age, which is not consistent with our understanding of oogenesis, because what we expect is that the oocytes do not divide after the birth of the mother, and yet there is an increase in the number of mutations uh, with the age of the father, uh, with the mother. Now, this could be because mutations in mothers occur because of DNA damage, in fathers, they occur because of both replication errors and DNA damage. And then the rate of uh, mutations, uh, in paternal mutations is about three times higher than uh, maternal uh, mutations. So this parameter, which is generally called male bias, uh, is about roughly three-fourth mutations from the father and one-fourth from the mother. Now, interestingly, when you actually look at this male bias with the age of the parents, what you find is something very surprising. What you see is that, uh, what your expectation would be is that because of spermatogonial cells dividing post-puberty continuously in males, there's a drastic increase in the male bias post-puberty. But in fact, when you look at the data, what you find is that the male bias is stable with age. And even at puberty, it's already three-fourth uh, mutations from the father compared to the mother. Moreover, you can look at this across a range of different mammals. These mammals differ in um, onset of uh, puberty, uh, mean age of reproduction, uh, male bias, all kinds of different life history traits. And yet the male bias is stable across all these species. And this suggests that a large proportion of mutations accumulate because of non-replicative sources also. So while replication does contribute some mutations, even non-replicative mutations happen uh, at a non-significant fraction. Now, another way you can study this is to look at different types of mutations. Different types of mutations accumulate because of different processes. So because of 
uh, methylation, uh, you tend to get more CPG mutations. You can then, again, in the pedigree data, break down different mutations by uh, type. And what you find is that uh, mutations accumulate uh, at different rates based on the paternal age and maternal age. For CPG mutations, they increase with the father's age, whereas for other types of mutations, in particular C2G mutations, they increase with mother's age. And this means that not only the total number of mutation depends upon the age of the parents, but also the mutation spectrum, that is the composition of different types of mutations, differs across individuals and depends upon the age of the parents. Now, another surprise from these data is that when you look at closely related species, what you find is that the rates of substitutions differ across species. We uh, most, uh, most of us in evolutionary biology use the molecular clock, and the bigger fundamental assumption of the clock is that the mutation rates for neutral mu uh, mutations is roughly constant across time. But if you look at uh, different uh, species, closely related species like humans and chimpanzees, you find that the rates differ by about 2%. Within apes, they differ almost by 10%. If you compare apes and old world monkeys, they differ by 40%. And compared to new world monkeys, they almost differ by twofold. And in these analyses, we have tried to control for uh, uh, try to control for uh, selection, conserve, we've removed conserved regions. And so to first approximation, these are neutral regions and we find still the rates differ across species. We can also look at the different uh, proportions of different types of mutations. So basically the mutation spectrum and we find even the spectrum differs across closely related species. Now, another big surprise is that uh, when you look even within a species, so in looking at different populations of humans, you find that the proportions of different types of mutations also differ. So in this analysis done by Harris and Pritchard, what they did is they looked at uh, different contexts of mutations. So looking at uh, A to C mutations that may be followed by say a T or a T and a C, and just measuring the rate of those mutations in Africans versus Europeans, you start finding that those rates differ significantly across uh, human populations. And one of the strongest signals of this uh, is uh, the mutation, which is TCC to, uh, which makes a TCC to T change. And this appears to be present at a higher rate in Europeans compared to non-European populations. And these findings have been replicated by others and it's related to a transient change that uh, may have occurred in European populations. Now, uh, let's take a step back and think about what are the different factors that impact mutations. So mutations arise in the pedigree. This is the mutation spectrum of let's say an offspring. This depends upon the age of the parents. It also depends upon the uh, DNA damage and repair machinery in the parent's genome. It can also depend upon the environmental exposures that the individual had during their lifetime. Over time, uh, these uh, mutations then get impacted by demography and selection. Selection in particular removes deleterious variants over time. And also these get impacted by another factor, which is biased gene conversion, which is a force where in a heteroduplex, when you have a mismatch, there tends to be a more tendency to repair uh, based on certain bases. So based on, uh, say, uh, in a T to G mismatch, you are more likely to repair based on the uh, G rather than the T. And so over time, this acts like selection in trying to push a uh, the genome composition towards a more GC uh, genome. There are counteracting forces, then push it back to uh, AT so that you have a more uniform base composition over time. But these factors can also lead to these significant differences that we see across human populations because all these factors can also then be impacted by demography. And so it still remains unclear how many changes have occurred in human uh, history because we haven't really accounted for all these different factors. And so this was the goal of a uh, recent analysis that we did in collaboration with Zivei Gao, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, and Yulin Zhang, who's a PhD student in my group. And what our goal was that we wanted to understand how many ch independent changes have occurred in the mutation spectrum in humans, uh, when have these changes occurred, and we also tried to investigate what the potential causes of these changes are. 
And uh, to do this, we developed a framework where we tried to add two key features to this framework. We added a time dimension, which allows us to make reliable comparisons of interpopulation differences. And we tried to also control for effects of bias gene conversion and selection. So to do this, we used uh, recent genealogy-based methods like RELATE, uh, where you can build a coalescent tree at different independent uh, uh, bits of the genome, and then you can place the mutations uh, on these branches, which gives you an age of the mutation. Once you have the age, you can then compare mutations of similar ages across human populations, thus in some way controlling for demography. And then in order to control for bias gene conversion, what we did is we looked at pairs of mutations that are similarly impacted by bias gene conversion. So mutations such as D2C and T2G, which are both favored by bias gene conversion, or mutations such as C2G to T2A, which neither is affected by bias gene conversion. To control for selection, we removed all the conserve regions and coding regions, uh, and also in the uh, uh, and uh, then compared the uh, ratios across populations. And so instead of comparing proportions of mutations, we instead compare ratios of mutations. So what I specifically mean here uh, in this complicated plot I'm showing you on the y-axis is the age of the different mutations. So from the output of RELATE, we have the age of every variant that is present in the population. We can then just bin it into uh, different uh, bins. Here we are looking at the bin 0 to 48 generations. These are all the mutations that are very recent in a population. We then estimate the rate, we then uh, estimate the mutation types. So is it T2C to, or T2G, C2A? And then we look at the ratio of two types of mutations. And that gives us a point estimate. In this case, it's four. We can then do some bootstrap resampling to estimate the uncertainty of that, repeat the exercise for different uh, time bins and also for different mutation types. We can then compare subsequent bins. And what we find is that we recover the European specific acceleration of the TCC mutations as Harris and Pritchard had shown. We can then repeat this analysis for different human populations. So here, each point is one uh, population. In red, I'm showing you Northern Europeans from 1,000 genomes data. Uh, uh, in green, it's East Asians. In uh, blue, it's Africans. And then we can, for each bin, we have the estimates in each of these populations. We can then just compare how uh, these different populations differ from uh, each other. And in doing that, what we find is that uh, uh, there are three main signals of interpopulation differences. So the first signal is the same one that I showed you earlier, which is present at non-CPG C to T to C to A mutations, which is uh, related to the TCC signal found that Harris and Pritchard found. We also see another new signal where we see that there is a divergence of C to G to T to A mutations. In this case, interestingly, it uh, is present in all three human populations. So all three human populations differ from each other. And also very interestingly, unlike the TCC signal, which is almost uh, over by the very recent time bins, we find that the C to G signal is still ongoing. And whatever the reasons might be, those factors are still present in the population, such that even if we took pedigree data, we would expect to find uh, the signal. And then the third most interesting signal is that at very old uh, ages, we find that uh, Africans and non-African populations differ from each other. So we find the signal at this T uh, to C to T to G mutations, where this ratio differs across Africans and non-Africans. So let's look at each of these signals in turn. So the first one is this European specific acceleration. Interestingly, uh, what Harris and Pritchard found is that uh, even in cancer studies, uh, this, sig uh, this signature, this co mutation context is uh, seen. And uh, what others found is also that uh, the, uh, and it may be related to UV exposure. Uh, and uh, there are other contexts such as ACC also, uh, ACC and uh, CCT that might also be contributing to these differences. So what we first looked at is, is the signal at non-CPGs uh, driven by these TCC mutations, including these additional contexts? So we just looked at our ratios at these contexts, and we found that it's most enriched at these contexts. 
And then when we remove these contexts, what we found is that the signal actually is still present. Uh, I want to note that uh, in my slides, when I show a star, it um, suggests that these results are significant and we are connecting for uh, multiple tests also. And when the results are not significant, I just write an NS over there. So you'll see that in the next few slides. Uh, and what this suggests is that the signal is while it might be uh, driven by TCC or might be related to TCC, TCC is not uh, the only type of mutations that con is contributing to the signal. In fact, there are other factors that might also be playing a role. And recent studies have suggested that this might be actually because of potentially genetic modifiers that might be segregating in human populations. Also that there might be differences because of generation time and other factors that might also be differentiating these populations. The next thing we looked at is the C2G to T2A mutations. In this case, in order to figure out if the differences are being driven by C2G or T2A, what we did is that we looked at the ratio with other types of mutations. So we first changed uh, the denominator uh, or the numerator, and we replaced the C2G with T2G, and then tried to see if the signal is still present. We found that still the, all three human populations are differentiated. Next, we changed it to T to C. We still saw the differences. But when we look at C to G versus C to A mutations, we don't find significant uh, differences anymore. Although it's not completely uh, non-significant, and so maybe there's still some contribution through C to G mutations also. And this suggests that the T to A mutation rate is highest in East Asians versus Europeans and uh, or Africans. And the C to G mutations is uh, mutations are sort of uh, slightly shifted in the other way. And next, look, let's look at our signal tree, which is, uh, in my opinion, the most interesting because these mutations are uh, differentiating. Um, these mutation, this ratio is differentiated in human populations. Just one second. Uh, Sorry, my pointer is disconnected with uh, how I look at it. So I have to constantly keep dragging it to the different screen. And so this way I just mirrored the displays. Um, and so let's first look at the signal, which uh, differs between uh, human populations, but at mutations that are very old. And these mutations are uh, predate the out of Africa migration. So at this point, all the mutations in the population are related to the mutations that arose in the common ancestor. And yet we find that there are differences between Africans and non-Africans. So when we first saw the signal, we were convinced that this must be some technical error in calling the ancestral alleles. But if we repolarize the data by using chimpanzees to call the ancestral allele, we still find that uh, the signal is present. Next, we uh, reason that one thing that is different between Africans and non-Africans is the history of Neanderthal ancestry. All non-Africans have about one to 2% Neanderthal ancestry, which is not present in Africans. And so we looked at regions that are intergressed from Neanderthals in modern humans, and just looked at the ratio in those regions or removed those regions and then looked at the differences across populations. And interestingly, even after removing those regions, we found that, uh, the, uh, that human populations are differentiated at this ratio. Then uh, we did some more uh, investigation. And what we did is we looked at mutations that might be related to Denisovans. So these are mutations where Denisovans have a derived allele and modern humans have a derived allele and Neanderthals have ancestral alleles. What we find is that the signal is still present. Next, we look at mutations where Neanderthals uh, have the derived alleles, modern humans have the derived alleles, but Denisovans uh, have the ancestral alleles and these uh, the signal is still present. Uh, and in this case, just to note that I'm removing these mutations. And so what we expect is if these mutations are driving the signal, we should not see any differences. Finally, what we did is we look, removed the mutations where both Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans all have the derived alleles. Once you remove those mutations, these, the signal disappears. And what this is telling us is that these are mutations that arose in the common ancestor. We can again look at these ratios uh, and change the numerator and denominator to find if it's the T2C or the T2G mutations. 
and we find that the signal is actually driven by uh, T to C uh, mutations. So the model that emerges from these analysis is that at some point in the past, in the common ancestor of modern humans, uh, about before the divergence of uh, modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans, there was a different rate of T to C in the common ancestral population. And somehow some of those lineages are still present in Africans and non-Africans, but present at different rates. And this sort of helps us understand both the predictions or that we saw, because we find that our ratios are differentiated uh, from the earlier bins. So this ratio drastically increases in these variants that are dated to be very old and there are interpopulation differences. And so somehow these lineages are present at different rates in uh, Africans and non-Africans and also are related to mutations that arose at a long time uh, in the past. And two possible sources that others have identified are mutations that might have might be due to an uh, gene flow from an unknown archaic uh, population. So if you look at the conditional site frequency spectrum in present day African populations, what you find is that there is a shift which based on simulations, people have proposed a model that there was gene flow from some unknown archaic population into the common ancestor of modern humans which is present at differential rates between Africans and non-Africans. And such a model could explain all the features of our uh, T2C signal. Another model that has also been proposed is that there was structure in the stem populations of uh, modern humans, uh, and that uh, different proportions of these lineages have now uh, are retained in Africans and non-Africans. And again, such a model could explain our results. So in future work, we are trying to investigate what are the uh, features of these two models and how that relates uh, to our results so that we can understand if there was a change in the mutation rate in the common ancestor, how that, uh, how that explains our uh, results. Now, finally, we in wanted to investigate how does generation time uh, play a role? How many of these differences that we see can be simply explained by differences in generation time over human evolution? And in order to do this, what we did is we went back to the pedigree data where we can again look at the different mutations at different contexts, but from the pedigree data, we can learn how the rate of those mutations depends upon the age of the parents. And then we can uh, look at the mutation, same uh, parameter in polymorphism data and relate back to try to infer the generation time in the past. So the idea is basically that we can look at the ratios that we have been comparing across populations in pedigree data and then compare that over uh, different ages. So we can estimate the ratio for all the parents who are say 20 years old uh, and versus parents who are 40 years old and then try to infer how the ratio changes uh, over time. Uh, uh, and then we can look at polymorphism data where we have these ratios for different time periods in evolution, and then project those back to uh, the pedigree data using simple regression techniques. And that can help us infer the generation uh, time in the pedigree data. We can repeat this analysis for different types of mutations for different age bins, and then see how does the generation time vary over time. And in doing so, what we find uh, in this uh, uh, is that the generation time has uh, very different values over using different mutation types as well as over different uh, time scales. So uh, let's look at just one window for time period of 55 to 126 generations. If you use the T to C mutations, we infer that the generation time is about 25 years. Uh, if you look at the C to T mutations, the generation time is about 35 years. And for other mutation types, it's also very young, about 20 years. And this suggests that generation time alone cannot be actually leading to these differences. There might be other factors. These patterns are also similar. Uh, similarly, the patterns over time are also uh, hard to explain just based on variation in generation time. And this suggests that gen changes in generation time alone cannot expect the patterns that we see across human po uh, polymorphisms. So in summary, th this uh, analysis has a number of implications. 
First, it suggests that demography and potentially admixture can have pervasive effects. They can even have effects on mutation rate, which we often assume is very similar across human populations. Life history traits like generation time cannot explain the patterns of differences that we see across populations or over time. And this suggests that potentially there are other factors like environmental exposures, uh, genetic modifiers that might also play a role in shaping the mutation landscape. And finally, uh, in uh, trying to use the molecular clock, some implications are really puzzling is that when we compare mutations across species, we find that uh, across species, there are very small differences across uh, species. So when you look at humans and chimpanzees, I told you the rates differ by about one to 2%. But if you look at very short time scales, you actually find bigger differences where mutations can differ by about 10 to 15%. So this suggests that over time, there is some stabilizing selection to maintain mutation rate at some optimal level across population. With that, I would like to thank my collaborators, Zibe Gao and Yulin in particular, uh, who uh, led all the work related to the uh, comparisons in human populations. Also a shout out to uh, Molly Shavarsky, who I did my postdoc with, and she was quite influential in getting me excited about all the questions related to mutation rate. Uh, and I would like to thank my lab for uh, helpful discussions throughout the development of this project. And thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Hi. Um, I'm sorry if this is a stupid question, but so in your plots, the y-axis goes back to like 3 million generations ago. Yeah. But wouldn't that like predate chimp and all that stuff? So like how... Like, why, why did you use chimp as an outgroup? And like, does that kind of make sense? I don't know, I'm just a little confused. So in most of the analysis, I should clarify, we use the human ancestral allele as the, uh, for polarizing the data. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at most of the data for differences at derived alleles. Uh, the divergence time of humans and chimpanzees is about 12 million years. So we are not going that far back, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just the variation in the coalescent rates. Most of the coalescent happens around one million-ish years, and then there is much that happens in the last few bins also. Okay, thank you. Thanks. We have a question from uh, Zoom, um, whether or not you've tried using the new telomere to telomere human reference genome, and whether you expect that that might have any effect on your estimates of mutation rate variation. Yeah, that's a great question. We do, have not tried using the new telomere to telomere genome. Uh, we have applied instead very strict filters for trying to look at the, uh, the genome that can be reliably called, but it would be great to actually use a more complete genome. Beautiful work. Thank you. Um, I was uh, wondering if we could come back to this question of are these spectra differences due to uh, environmental factors or potentially also genetic factors? I realize that the, the way that you calculate the spectra is for big kind of population groups. I was wondering if you could get uh, some metric at an individual level or smaller populations uh, so that you could do uh, some type of genetic mapping and potentially identify mutation rate modifiers. Do you think that will be feasible? Yeah, I think that would be uh, a really interesting direction to go in. One of the challenges in doing that is uh, is that the effect sizes are really small, and that means that you need lots of individuals. Uh, and uh, we have done some power calculations, and at least the current data sets don't afford to do these analysis yet. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome work. This was great. Uh, I'm Arun Seth Raman from San Diego State. Uh, so some of our work is, you know, we've, we've shown clearly that there are sort of differences in the rates of introgression from this sort of ancestral ghost from um, in West African versus Eastern African population. So I was just curious to see if you had, because uh, you, I think the individuals you had included from Western Africa. So I was wondering if you re recapitulated the same patterns in Eastern African populations. Yeah. So in terms of Eastern African populations, we have only looked at Luya which I believe are admixed uh, with Bantu ancestry. Uh, we do see similar signals. We haven't specifically looked at if there are differences between West and East Africans, but we are definitely interested in looking at that. Hi Priya, this Hi. is Xiaohong from U Chicago. This is uh, 
kind of random and I'm probably taking inspiration from the keynote talk two nights ago, but um, I remember we learned in undergrad that you, prokaryotes uh, have higher mutation rate partly because their DNA are not wrapped around histone to form a nucleosome. And I, I kind of remember that during spermatogenesis, the sperms lose a lot of nucleosome. Have you observed any mutational patterns that corresponds to the part of losing histones? Yeah, so that's a very interesting point. Uh, there is a much higher mutation rate in males. It appears to also be higher by puberty, which means that potentially the higher mutation rate arises in sperm. Sperm also lacks some types of repair. So it's actually an ongoing uh, project in our lab is to try to do single cell sequencing of sperm and to try to study the mutation landscape in sperm. Um, it would be very exciting to directly see these mutations. Um, I didn't know the results about prokaryotes, so we can also try to see if there are differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Oh yeah, I was just mostly curious about before and after uh, spermatogenesis. But yeah, it would be great if we could do that. Uh, single cell genomic sequencing still is an experimental technique, but we are still trying it and we are trying to do it uh, uh, in mice with different ages. And so potentially that will help us see if that those differences occur. That's super awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank Priya one more time. <laughs> and our next speaker is Rory Rolfs, who will be asking whether medical privacy could be compromised by associations between forensic loci and expression levels of neighboring genes. Thanks, y'all. How are you doing? You're still here. Yeah, in person conference. <laughs> okay, first, huge thanks to the PEQG organizers. I have enjoyed this conference so much, and I know so many other people here have. So, thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be able to speak here today. Okay, first, a little context. I performed this work with a lab of incredible students at San Francisco State University, which Pliny Pennings introduced very well yesterday. Uh, San Francisco State University is a predominantly undergraduate institution situated on unceded Ramitush Ohlone lands. And if you, like me, are a non-Indigenous person who lives or plays or works in the San Francisco Bay Area, then you can support land rematriation by paying your Shumi land tax. And I'm putting this here because I think other people are in the same boat with me here. Okay. In this place, on these lands in the United States, forensic genetic identification has become very commonly known, often through dramatic TV series, some of which are very surprisingly long lived. <laughs> but these media are not the only way that people uh, interact with forensic genetics. The combined co DNA index system, or CODIS, is the federal body that governs forensic genetic identification in the United States. CODIS maintains a federal database with more than 20, 20 million profiles. So that's uh, people who are, have been convicted or accused of a felony, typically, although the rules are different in different jurisdictions. And in addition, they maintain a database of over 500,000 uh, uh, forensic samples, or sorry, I'm sorry. And the, that database has been used uh, to assist in over half a million cases. Okay, this is in addition to profiles stored in state and local databases. So all of this is to say that forensic genetic technologies have a very large social impact in the United States. Okay, so you all, we have a shared kind of common understanding of what forensic genetics is, but let's get a little more specific about how these technologies work. Okay, so generally you have a crime scene sample, some piece of tissue, in this case, there's a little hair being held by those tweezers, and you have a suspect. So you can extract DNA from both of those, and then you can create, you know, you genotype some kind of genetic profile and you check for a match. Okay. But what is this genetic profile? So the profile is, uh, consists of 13 to 20 STRs. And I have to ask, who here has ever dealt with STR data? Okay, okay, who here knows what an STR is? That's more than I thought. Okay, that's cool. Okay, for anyone who doesn't know, because they, they, they have, somewhat fallen out of fashion, despite the fact that they're a super interesting form of genetic variation. And STR is a short tandem repeat. 
So it's this kind of genetic variant where you have a, a little motif that repeats in a row, like in this example, GTT repeats four times. And what varies in an STR is the number of those repeats. So one individual might have four repeating units and another might have seven. So these loci are interesting. They're highly multi-allelic. The, uh, the loci used for forensic identification have eight to 27 alleles per locus, which gives them a lot of identifying information, which is nice for forensics. Okay, and what are the specific coded STRs used in the United States? Here they are. You can see how they're distributed on the genome. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of history. So these were chosen originally in 1998, and there were just 13 STRs chosen then. And they were chosen for pretty practical reasons, because uh, they could be reliably multiplexed with PCR, so they can be genotyped cheaply and easily, because they're highly polymorphic, so there's a lot of identifying information, because there are little population differences, although you can talk to some of my students about some caveats with that, uh, that assumption, uh, because they're in gene deserts, uh, and, and so these were the set that was used for, you know, a, a couple decades. And then in 2017, the FBI decided that we should, you know, take advantage of genetic advances and uh, extend this. So, so now we use 20 STRs. Okay. But I want to return to this assumption about the gene deserts. So this is a really important assumption for a legal reason, because medical information has legal protections. So the ways that... Uh, these CODIS profiles are seized, stored, and shared, assumes that they contain no medical information about the, the people they come from. Okay, so I'm going to ask you all, and I'm asking you to interact with me right now. It's Friday afternoon, so hopefully it keeps you awake. I want you to do a finger pull. So that means I'm going to ask you to put up your hand with your fingers to answer this question. In your opinion, right now, do you think, could CODIS STRs reveal medical information? So one finger is absolutely not, three is solid maybe, and five is yes, definitely. <laughs> I shouldn't give this talk to this audience. Okay. So, okay, so I saw a lot of people with a five. I saw some people with a three though. Okay, so, so work with me here. Okay, so for, for people who are not as familiar with STRs, you might not know that we actually know that some STRs do impact medical traits. And, you know, that's obviously a small minority, but here is a kind of a prototypical typical example is Huntington's disease, where we have this, S, this coding STR expansion. And when you have a, a relatively short allele with few copies, then you're neurotypical. Uh, and when you have a, an extended allele with many, many copies, then you have Huntington's disease, which is like a progressive neurological disorder. Okay, so uh, let's get back to these CODIS loci. So we've learned a little bit about the genome since the 90s when they were decided upon. And now when we look at the CODIS loci in the context of the genome, we see that 11 out of the 20 CODIS loci are actually intronic, and that 17 out of the 20 are within 100 KB of a gene. And I want to remind you that these profiles uh, have been taken, uh, we have a database of these profiles for well over 20 million people in the United States. And these are people who have been entangled in the criminal justice system, which means that this database is overrepresenting Black, Latina, Indigenous people, people with low income. So this is something that, you know, is, is worth examining already. In the, if, if, if you're not already convinced, then another thing that we can think about for these profiles is that uh, their kind of storage and sharing is not regulated at local levels. So for example, a few months ago in San Francisco, it came out that there was this woman who was a sexual assault survivor. In that process, she had her profile taken. Uh, and then years later, that it turns out that profile was transferred to a criminal database and was used to identify, identify her as a suspect in a case. And that practice is not unique to San Francisco. This kind of practice is actually quite common in unregulated local databases. So our question is, how, is the medical privacy of people with these profiles being stored maintained? That's our broad question. So, you know, that's a broad question. It's hard to answer immediately. So we, we started by trying to answer a, a more narrow question, which is, do the CODIS genotypes reveal information about gene expression levels? So I worked on this project with a team of incredible students, some of whom are here today, 
for Myra Manuelos, she's not here today. She was an undergrad with me and now she's getting her PhD at Brown with Dr. Huerta Sanchez, who you'll know. We've got Yomi Zabaleta, who is here. You can stand up, Yomi, please. Thank you. So Yomi was a master's student with me and now he's over at Verily working on their debug project. You can talk to him about all of that. We've got Eleni Rodan, who is someplace here too. We've got Eleni, who is already famous from yesterday, but as, as you know, is starting med school in like a month. So they're incredible. And Rochelle Reyes, who worked on this project for years, was an undergrad with me and now is getting their master's in public health at UC San Diego. Okay. Yeah, Rochelle. You can listen to this later, Michelle. Okay, so, so we needed some data and we got data from the Thousand Genomes Project. Actually, I think we'll get a very similar data set as Dr. Hernandez who gave us our keynote earlier on here. So uh, from the Thousand Genomes Project, we got imputed genotypes for the CODIS loci. And then uh, those same individuals, 372 of those same individuals have lymphoblast cell lines that have been, uh, that we have transcriptomes for. Uh, from these five population groups. Okay, so the next thing we did, so Myra Banuelos was the first uh, undergrad who was working on this project. So she looked at each CODIS locus and all the genes that are expressed in those lymphoblast cell lines within 100 KB. So there are a total of 39 such pairs of CODIS locus and expressed gene. And she tested for correlation between the CODIS genotype uh, and the gene expression. So she found one significant association after correcting for multiple testing and five marginally significant associations. And so here you can see, this is uh, the, the significant finding that we have. So on the x-axis, we've got the genotype for D3, which is the, the CODIS locus that we're looking at. And then LARS2 is the gene. So the R squared is not very large, but the association is statistically significant. So we wanna follow up on this. Oh, and I should say that we did this analysis with population group as a covariate to see if uh, you know, population structure was a confounding factor and we have very similar results. And so it doesn't look like that. Okay, so, but we, we wanna know, like, what is the mechanism that's driving these CODIS ESTRs? Oh, I call these, we call these CODIS ESTRs because they're CODIS expression STRs. So what's the mechanism driving the CODIS ESTR associations? Could they be causal? like the Huntington's locus, could they actually be causing the changes in expression level? Or could they not be causal, but they could be an LD with a different causal locus? Or are they just spurious? Or, you know, you know, there's some other factor. It's, it's not a molecular connection. Okay, so this is where Yomi came in. And uh, one of the first things that he looked at is DNAs1 hypersensitivity sites. And the, so these are, you know, putative regulatory sites. And he looked at the distance between each CODIS locus and the nearest DNA one hypersensitivity site. And, uh, and we compare this to uh, genomic STRs, which is there's a fantastic resource uh, published by Melissa Gimmerich's group that defines where all of these genomic STRs are. Okay, so the genomic STRs are the main histogram and these arrows that you see are uh, the distances between the CODIS loci and the nearest DNA one hypersensitivity site. So uh, the CODIS ESTRs specific. So, you know, what you really might notice here is way on the left there, we have a, a CODIS locus, a CSF1PO, that entirely overlaps with the DHS site. And so this is what we have on, uh, let's see, the red track here is the location of DHS sites. The orange line there is the location of CSF1PO, the CODIS locus. And below it, you can see it's CSF1PO is intronic to CSF1R. Okay, so it entirely overlaps with a putative regulatory region, which makes us think, you know, it's possible that could be causal. Okay, but let's investigate this other hypothesis of a, a CODIS locus being in LD with a different causal locus. And this is actually is a, it's very nice. I mean, Pliny Pennings gave a beautiful talk yesterday, no? Can we give it up for Pliny in her talk, please? Mm. I mean, uh, that is how you do it amazing. I'm, and I'm, I'm giving her props right now because the preliminary work for this was done by a team of undergraduates in one of the programs that she was describing in the Pink Summer program. So the preliminary work kind of defining the LD landscape around the CODIS ESTRs was done by Bet Yin, Eleni Roldan, who joined the lab, Bernice Chavez-Rojas, who also joined the lab, but she's off managing a lab at Harvard now, 
Maribel Santos and Ana Rodriguez Vega, who I think was also mentioned in Pliny's talk. She's like, yeah, okay. So, so they, they did this preliminary work. Okay, Eleni stayed on in a lab and, and continued the work to make it you know, publishable quality. So what they did was they uh, computed the LD between the CODIS STR D3, that's the one that we're looking at right now, that's the orange line there, and all the SNPs within 100 KB. Okay, so you can see how the LD varies. Below that, there's the DHS track, and below that, there's the gene track. So you can see that we have LARS2. And you can see uh, in the LD track, the dots that are filled in with red are SNPs that are located inside a DHS site. So D3 is indeed in LD with DHS sites and with variants assorting within DHS sites, which supports the hypothesis that maybe D3 is in LD with a, a variant that's regulating expression levels. But we wanted to dive a little bit deeper and Myra came back around uh, and we were thinking about, okay, but it would be really nice to know what are the variants that are controlling the expression levels of these genes, and then we can compare those. If we knew what those are, then we can see, no, for real, are they in LD with the codocytes? So Myra used caviar to try to do that. So she broke down our data into these five kind of superpopulations, and she performed not really GWAS, but like local OS, where she just uh, tested for expression association for between each variant in the local region and expression levels. And then she used caviar, which uh, identifies this causal row set. So it's a set of variants that are uh, likely to contain the causal variant with likelihood row. Okay. So what did she find? So uh, within the Yoruban population, she found that D18, which is one of our CODIS ESTRs, is actually in the row causal set. So this is consistent with a hypothesis that it might be impacting expression in that population. Uh, she found a little bit of a different story uh, for D3. In the Finnish population, she found that D3 is not in the row causal set, but has very high LD with a SNP that is in the row causal set. And uh, same, she found a, a similar result in the Great British population as well. Okay, so what I feel like I learned from these follow-ups is that at least some of the CODIS ESTRs have putative mechanisms uh, for molecular association. So. Uh, we have potential causation for CSF1PO and D18, and we have potential LD with a causal locus for D3. So, you know, assuming that I've convinced you that there's some kind of association happening here, then the next question is, well, what does that mean for medical privacy? This is just expression levels. That's not really getting at any phenotype of, you know, value. So this is where Rochelle came in. And uh, Rochelle did this extensive uh, literature search in the medical literature. And I have to say, Rochelle was, uh, was working to go to med school and was like really ready to do this. And I am so grateful because it is really not my forte to like dive in the medical literature. But they found that uh, they looked at CSF1R. And so that's the gene that surrounds uh, CSF1PO. And they found that this gene encodes a cytokine receptor that regulates microglia which are neural immune cells. And uh, CSF1R is actually, we, we know a little bit about from the literature, total disruption of CSF1R leads to a number of different brain conditions, but inhibition of CSF1R uh, is actually used therapeutically for other brain conditions. So it's, uh, so sometimes the doctors will inhibit CSF1R function and it improves epilepsy, Alzheimer's, and it speeds spinal cord injury recovery. Okay, so clearly this gene has some impact, uh, but that's all kind of, you know, like disruption or it, it, it's kind of extreme uh, actions on the gene. But Rochelle sounds found something else that's very relevant to what we're doing. So they found uh, quite a few papers actually showing that variation in expression levels and splicing of CSF1R are associated with depression and schizophrenia. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you this again. We're doing the finger poll again. Now that I've told the story, do you think that CODIS STRs could reveal medical information? So one finger is absolutely not, three is solid maybe, and five is yes. Okay, <laughs> okay, the threes turn to fives, I think. Okay, so we, we think so too. We think this is worth looking into. We published, or we put up a manuscript about this on the Med Archive, and you can check it out. Uh, and our, our manuscript is currently in review also.
because we feel like this is an important story for many people to hear, not just scientists who are up for reading medical arch med archive papers, uh, the students also made a video abstract. And I'm going to play for you a clip of that abstract here. Think about your genetic information as a buyer. It's unique to you, and it contains the most significant secrets. What if one day someone talks down the battery? Not all of it, but some. Perhaps it's that I'm not the genetics of your battery, but the number of times you use a particular word. So they copy the information down and store the genetic information in the diary and the library. What if the job they copy down wasn't very job? What if it's actually important information that we're going to have to so if you want to hear more, then you can meet with these students, especially Yomi and Eleni, who are here, and they'll give you the link for, for this video. Okay, so uh, okay, so we're interested in the broad question of if medical information can be inferred through CODIS loci. And we try to identify, we try to get at that through these expression correlations, but there's lots of other ways that we could consider this. For example, uh, we can think about if the CODIS STRs are have some correlation with GWAS sites, which have some correlation with medical loci. So this is a plot that I actually showed you earlier, but I didn't point out then that here, so again, on the x-axis, we've got the genome, in the yellow line is our CODIS STR, and we got the LD of all the surrounding SNPs. And now I'm showing you that the SNPs that are filled in with blue are GWAS sites, are GWAS hits. Okay. So, so we're, we want to investigate this and see, can we infer medical information through surrounding GWAS sites? And we're currently, I'm very excited that we've been able to team up with Doc Edge, who is someplace in this room as well. He's back there. He doesn't want to stand up. And Vivian Link, who has also gave a wonderful talk a couple days ago, um, and, and other students in his lab, Judy Wang and Linda Ding, and Yomi Zavaleta has again helped on this project. So I'll give you, we don't have solid results, but I'll give you a couple of our preliminary results that were, you know, pique our curiosity. Okay, so first we wanted to do some kind of just exploratory statistics. So <clears throat> we looked, we, we asked this question, are CODIS loci closer to GWAS sites than genomic STRs? So we just measured the distance between each CODIS loci to the nearest GWAS site. And we and for genomic SDRs, same thing. Distance between the genomic SDR and the nearest GWAS site. And this is what we've got. So the yellow, uh, the yellow distribution here is the distribution of those distances for CODIS SDRs. And the pink is the distribution for genomic SDRs. And uh, you can note that the, the x-axis is in log scale. That's why the means look kind of funny. Okay, but this is showing that indeed the CODIS loci are actually closer to GWAS sites than your average STR. Okay. That's interesting, but that's just one GWAS site. Like what, what does it mean to be close to one GWAS site? So then we asked another kind of simple, you know, test statistic type question where we're looking at, uh, we're trying to find out our CODIS loci in more GWAS dense regions. So now we counted the number of GWAS sites within a hundred KB window surrounding the CODIS loci and surrounding uh, other genomic STRs. And this is what we came up with. So again, the yellow distribution here is the, the number of GWAS sites surrounding CODIS STRs versus genomic STRs in pink. So again, we see that the CODIS STRs are actually in more GWAS dense regions than the non-CODIS STRs. So what is it about CODIS loci? In theory, they were chosen to be in gene deserts, but, you know, people did the best they could in, 19, in the 90s, but it didn't, that didn't turn out very well. So, so I'm curious, like, why, why do we see these patterns? And, and we're curious, okay, so it's one thing to be near GWAS, but are they actually particularly informative about the GWAS traits is another question. And we don't have the answers yet, but I invite you to stay tuned and see what we're cooking up over here. Okay, I'm getting towards the end here, but I have a few other kind of advertisements to give you about other projects that are happening in the lab and that students have brought here today. So uh, in addition to this project, we do some projects that are looking at the accuracy of different forensic technologies and trying to estimate the accuracy and quantify it. So there's a team in my lab who's looking at to try to quantify the accuracy of DNA mixture analysis, which is used really ubiquitously in the United States. And there are many students who have contributed to this project over the last couple of years. And there are a few students who are here today. So Carolee and Evan, can you please stand up? 
Yes, that's right. So, and Cam Felix, unfortunately, is not here today. Um, but Kara and Evan presented a poster last night. If you didn't get a chance to talk with them about it then, then you're very welcome to find them later on today. And uh, then another project that students in the lab have been working on is trying to quantify the accuracy of forensic genetic genealogical searching, which is a, fa a fairly new technology um, where you you identify like a, a distant cousin of the person you're looking for and then create the genealogical tree and then uh, try to identify your, the person you're seeking. So again, many students contributed to this project over the years and we have some students who are here today. Uh, so Miguel and Joaquin, I think is not here anymore, but Miguel, Shalom and Sten, can you please stand? Yeah. So the three of them presented a poster on this project last night. And again, if you didn't get to see it, I invite you to talk with them later today. And I have to say, Emily Zamperio is also here, right? She's like on her phone, come on. <laughs> so Emily used to work on this project and now she's transitioned to uh, helping support the gold project, which is one of the, the projects that Pliny had talked about yesterday as well. Okay. So finally, I have a, a, a very direct ad for you, which is that we have NSF funding, I'm very happy to say, and I am looking to hire a postdoc. So if you are looking for a postdoc lab and you're interested in the kind of stuff that we do, please hit me up. I would be happy to hear from you. And then finally, I have so many people to say thank you to for this. First, my collaborators, Dr. Zuerta Sanchez, Edge, and Pennings are the most amazing collaborators. I'm so grateful to work with each of you. Uh, my union my university and my funding, the many, many students who have contributed to all these projects. They are amazing. Uh, and my partner, who's right there. He did the child care. I'm happy to take questions. Hey, Rory, that was super cool. Uh, I'm wondering if it's possible to like use SNPs to impute STRs and then you could do like uh, imputed association studies in Biobank or whatever. Yeah, totally. So the question is, can could you use SNPs to impute STRs or perhaps even the other way around, you could use the STR to impute SNPs and then you can get all kind of medical information that way as well. Yes, indeed, you can. Uh, Noah Rosenberg Lab has put out a bunch of interesting papers on that topic and uh, I mean, the short answer is yes, with some degree of certainty. So it's another kind of avenue to investigate. Awesome, yeah, hi Rory, yeah, again, great talk and uh, great work. Um, so I was just curious about uh, the imputation, which I think is something you've glossed a little bit over, like how like how long range can you like impute genotype or how well does that actually, right? Because you, you some of you don't know that the, uh, yeah, you said there's some imputation step in the very beginning, right? To sort of associate the STRs with the SNPs and so on. Okay, I didn't quite get the question. The question is like, yeah. how well does the STR imputation work? Yes. Okay, yeah. um, with varying degree. So that's a, it's a limitation of the analysis that we have here because we did it with imputed STR data and uh, especially the CODIS loci are particularly hard to impute because they're very long and they're very polymorphic. So that means that our signal eroded to some degree. So right now we're actually doing some power analyses to see you know how that kind of imputation error makes it even harder for us to detect something i think we have time for just one more question i think hi um thanks for the fantastic talk um just wondering whether you know what's the dna forensic situation like in countries other than the us and whether there are similar um ethical and legal concerns and whether a particular country does a better job or something Okay, so it's kind of like a, an international question. It's like, how do other countries handle? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it's handled very differently in different countries. I, and uh, I'm afraid I don't have like the most extensive international perspective. Uh, in the UK, their database is actually like proportionally to the population, much, much larger. And that's viewed with less suspicion than in the United States for lots of cultural and political reasons. Uh, that's the short answer I can give you. Thank you. Let's thank Rory one more time. Thank you.
And then closing out this session uh, is Dan Runcy, uh, who will be talking about uncovering the genetic basis of local adaptation in maize with large scale multi environment trials. Hi, everyone. Do huh? you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks for uh, staying to the end. Um, thanks for a great conference, the, all, all the organizers. I've had a lot of fun. Um, so my talk today is about the genetic and environmental factors that shape the tremendous diversity that we see in maize as it's grown by farmers across the Americas or across the world, and how we might be able to use this diversity to try to identify genes and alleles that may be useful for breeding new climate tolerant varieties. So this work that I'm gonna talk about is the result of a very large team across many institutions. And my lab is just a small part of this. So I want to first acknowledge the tremendous the work, creativity, and vision that this team has had to went into the, the data that I'll draw on today. So germplasm repositories or, or gene banks hold, the, hold millions of accessions of uh, crop species from farms collected across the world. These accessions um, capture a wide range of genetic diversity and all sorts of traits from disease resistance to quality traits, to nutritional traits. Um, and these are currently largely untapped by modern breeding programs. This map here shows the geographic distribution or range of over 17,000 maize accessions stored by CIMIT, which is the International Maize and Wheat um, Improvement Center in Mexico. Um, and you see they stand a wide range of environments from the, you know, the Caribbean islands to tropical lowlands to highland mountainous regions over 4,000 meters. And I think that as climates change and agriculture is forced to uh, you know, adapt so it can continuously feed this continuously growing world, um, these germplasm resources are a, a real important resource for mining and finding important alleles that may be able to, to help us create crops that, that work. But how do we do this? How do we prioritize um, accessions to move into breeding programs or mine them for useful alleles? So what alleles drive local adaptation to these environmental gradients? Which accessions might be useful? And how can breeders actually use these resources to advance lines that might, may, might be useful for future climates. Ultimately, the main way to identify accessions or to, to test alleles is to actually compare them in real world conditions. And this is always a massive undertaking, requiring very large field trials with across many locations um, with hundreds and thousands of accessions. And it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, the data set that I'm going to be drawing on today was created by a, a large team at CIMIT. Um, they grew over 3,700 accessions across 32 trials in, in 13 locations in Mexico. And um, I'll be working with data from six fitness-related traits. So uh, the time of flowering, plant height, uh, the anthesis silking interval, which is often used in maize as a measure of uh, plant stress, and then three measures of, of, of yield, the, the weight of the cob, the weight of the grain, and what we call field weight, which is sort of the, the sum of those. Um, the original um, experiment here was, was, was presented several years ago by Romero Navarro et al. Um, uh, but I'm going to expand on that analysis in a few ways. So the first um, analysis of this is that we started by asking the simple question, is there any evidence in this data set for local adaptation um, to environmental or climate factors? So one way to, to look at that um, is to ask the question whether accessions co collected environments that are similar to the environment for a particular trial do better in that trial than accessions collected in more disparate environments. And if so, what you'd expect to see in a plot like this um, would be a, a concave curve where the, the peak of that curve is sort of centered at the environmental descriptor of, of the trial. And so in this case, using field weight as a, as a yield measure um, and plotting the uh, the best fit curve to to the the field weight data. Um, so each each section is essentially a, a position based on the elevation that it was collected, and then a, a line for the the height of the trial. And you know more or less, it seems like the the best accessions were collected about thousand meters, like this trial. And I can expand that out to all I think it's twelve trials where we had this field weight data, and to a large extent, or to some extent at least, you see the same pattern repeated in each of these trials. Um, where the the uh, the elevation of land races with the the best um, field weight were approximately at the elevation of of that trial. So to formalize this, I, I just 
uh, took that point that was predicted of the highest yield and plotted that against the elevation of the trial. And you see, you know, more or less a pretty good fit. Um, so that's evidence of local adaptation. That's a good starting point. But I'm also plotting on here with the size of the point, the strength of that relationship. And generally, these strengths are pretty weak. Um, there's only a couple trials where that relationship was even nominally significant. And if we go to other measures of yield, like grain weight, th that relationship is, is much weaker still. So where does that leave us? Um, I think that means that you know, the collection its environment itself is, is only weakly predictive of, of performance or, or usefulness in that particular environment. So if we're just going to go into accession germ blank based on the, the climate of origin of each of our accessions, we're probably not going to do very well. We need to have more information to be able to make accurate selections among those millions of, of candidates. So the next question is, can genomic information help? We can sequence genomic markers on, on many accessions, often cheaper than we can do dozens of field trials on them. So can we use this information to be able to, to more effectively select useful accessions? Um, to, in order to do this, so, um, you need to figure out, in order to do this, we're going to have to figure out if which genomic loci to actually look at, which markers are going to be useful. And um, we think that the ones that are going to be useful are, are ones that are somehow involved in that local adaptation. And so uh, these are going to be loci that control gene environment interactions. Back to this example that I just gave, um, what I showed here is that the uh, different accessions had the best performance in different trials, which means that the relative performance of different accessions is changing across trials. And so that, that means that, uh, that there was gene environment interactions in this data set. Gene environment interactions like this are uh, important for understanding local adaptation. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on how to I measure, model, and characterize the genomic loci that control genomic in, uh, gene environment interactions. I'll, I'll start ask how much G by E is there um, in this population? Can we predict that G by E? And what genomic loci control the G by E? So first, I'm gonna take a, a minute to describe how I measure and model gene environment interactions. So here's you know, a classic picture of a gene environment interaction. I have two trials, one and two, two accessions or lines, A and B, and I'm plotting their, uh, say their yield in each, in each environment. And then I connect them with a line. And so that line has a slope. That slope represents the plasticity, how much its yield changed across environments. And if, since these two slopes are different, um, they have different responses to the environment. And so we call that a G by E. Now, these two trials, I'm saying they're, they represent two different environments. And so you know, a simple model for this phenomena that we can use to quantify this is to represent or the yeah represent the yield say as a as a sum of a main effect of, geno of genotype a main effect of environment a specific effect of a genotype in a particular environment and error and it's that specific effect what we often call the gene environment interaction that uh, we're most interested in if that term is zero we say there's no d by e if that term is non-zero then there is um, that's a simple model. There's a couple of problems with applying it to our, our data set. Um, first, we in this experiment, there was actually no replication of uh, a particular line in a particular environment. Um, and so we can't directly estimate or separate the genotype environment term from, from error. So instead, what I'm going to focus on is the additive genetic component to that gene environment interaction, which we can model with the, the marker-based kinship matrix. Um, and that leaves that the error term here is going to be both measurement error and also the non-additive genetics that uh, wasn't captured by the additive model. So that, that's, that works there. The other problem is that we don't just have two trials. We have 32 trials or, or so. Um, and in the reaction norm model like this, it gets kind of complicated in a sense to add different environments. So I just put a third environment on my chart here. And you know, there's a big crossing or different slopes between one and two and not much between two and three. And so you could describe it that way. But if I just switch the orders of one and two in this plot, I get a completely different picture. And that's not very satisfying. Um, also, modeling is a little bit more complicated because uh, the genetic main effects and G by E are often correlated. And we really have to account for those correlations to be able to do this modeling well. So I think that 
you know, for me at least, uh, there's another way of thinking about gene environments that I think is often conceptually simpler or, or easier to, to work with. And that's that we all have to think, or you know, the reaction norm model, we think of the yield in trial one and yield in trial two as different versions of the same trait. But there's in quantitative genetics, there's an equivalent way of thinking about that. And that's um, describing the yield in trial one as a trait, the yield in trial two as a different trait. Um, and, uh, and so we're measuring two traits on each line. And then we can plot them against each other, say on a scatter plot like this. And um, if the if the points, say the point for line one or the point for line two, are anyway off the one to one line, that means that those traits are different in the two trials. And so we call that a G by E. It's an equivalent um, representation. Another way of thinking about it is if we put more, more lines on here, if the correlation is anything less than one, that's G by E. If the correlation is exactly one, we would say no G by E. So um, that's another way of thinking about that. Why I like the correlated traits model is that it's in some sense, simpler to extend to more trials. We just consider them all in a pairwise fashion. Um, now, uh, I think that the modeling of it is a little bit easier too. So this is the model I proposed for, or showed for the reaction norm approach. For the correlated traits model, what we do is we, we write a model for trial one, and then a model for trial two, and a model for trial three. And in each of these models, I have a genetic effect. Say A1 is the additive genetic effect or the breeding value in trial one and so on. And then I just specify that these genetic values are correlated across trials. Um, they can also have correlated errors. And conceptually, the reaction or model is a model of genetic differences across environments, while the correlated trait model is a model of genetic similarities across trials. So um, two sides of the same coin. Um, but I like the correlated traits model because it also gives you a lot of flexibility if your trials have different experimental designs to write the specific model for each one. Um, and so it makes something simpler. But if you like the reaction norm better, model better, don't worry. They're actually exactly the same model as long as you fully specify all the covariance terms appropriately in that, in that other model. So anyway, um, as I said, the correlated traits model makes it conceptually simple to scale up to many, many environments. But the problem is the challenge on the, on the statistical side is that as you add more trials, the number of parameters you have to estimate to model that G by E increases and increases quadratically, as we talked, actually was talked about earlier. Um, and so this graph, I show the number of traits or number of trials on the x-axis and number of parameters we have to measure. And so the red line is the number of uh, you know, these covariance parameters we have to estimate is going up quadratically, while our data we're collecting in the same amount of you know, line data per trial, that's increasing linearly. And so you get very close, very quickly to a situation where you have more parameters to estimate than data. And that's a classical statistical problem um, where we run into issues. So this is a problem that my group has worked on for a number of years. Um, and in collaboration with Lauren Crawford, who we heard, about, heard from earlier, we have developed this R package and a statistical model called Mega LMM, which we think is very effective at fitting the necessary what we call multivariate linear mixed models to estimate all these parameters very efficiently. Um, just to show you that it works, um, this is a figure from our, our paper on this. Um, we did a simulation in a data set with, in this case, we had about 650 lines, and we simulated different numbers of, of trials or traits um, with a particular covariance structure and then re estimated it with the model. Um, the first curve here shows the estimate if you do it in sort of a, a naive or a traditional uh, approach using REML, the software is MTG2, and you see the expected thing that as you add more traits, the accuracy sorry, of, of that estimation goes down. Or yeah, accuracy goes down, the error goes up. Um, if we use Bayesian methods like MC, MCGLMM or our mega LMM, we actually do better overall because the prior um, regularizes these estimates. And one thing we see, we actually do better in under realistic, we think are realistic scenarios with mega LMM, the more trials we put in, we actually get a, it works better. Um, that was the, in this case, the residual covariance. Um, if we look at the genetic covariance, which is also important to estimate, we get sort of the same patterns. And I want to point out that uh, I only have a point here for 120 trials for mega LMM. I didn't even try to do it with these other programs. And that the reason is that they're, the time that it would take to fit uh, large data sets with other programs is, is really prohibitive. Um, here I'm showing the number of hours it would take to fit a data set, even just not even worrying about how well it's fitting, 
against a number of traits. And the other programs increase quadratically or cubically. And so by 100 traits, it's hours. By a couple hundred traits, it's weeks. And then years, very quickly. Mega LMM, though, we've transformed the problem in a way that it's a linear scaling. And so we've been able to apply it successfully to 20,000 traits um, and get where we think are fairly reasonable estimates of genetic and residual covariances. Um, but anyway, that's an advertisement for the program. Um, our data set today is not that big. We have 30 trials. Um, and so back to that. So I propose I want to answer these three questions here. Um, so I'll go through them now about G by E. First, how much G by E is there? Well, using mega LMM, we can estimate it, ask how much G genetic, you know, genetic main effects, G by E and, and error. Um, and so I put the genetic main effects in red, G by E in green and residuals in blue. And we see all of the genetic variance is G by E according to our model in this data set. Um, and that's not really surprising. All that means is that the breeding values aren't constant across all the trials, which we can see by you know, making a heat map of the correlations. And in this case, I'm showing the, feet, the field weight yield, yield measure. And all the trials are pretty much positively correlated in their genetic values, but those correlations are less than one. And as soon as you add one trial where that behaves, the lines behave differently than any other trial, uh, we suddenly will call it all G by E. So it's sort of almost not an interesting answer, but it's there. Okay, so the second question was, okay, if there is G by E, can we predict it? Well, predicting G by E is really just predicting the genetic value in environment one, predicting the genetic value in environment two, and then taking the difference. So predicting G by E means how well can we predict in each environment? That's just standard genomic prediction. We do that all the time in agriculture. And so if I use a standard genomic prediction model, um, say GBLEP, uh, uh, it can do okay in this data set. Accuracy is 0.3 to 0.4, mostly ASI, we had no ability to predict. But we should be able to do better than this, accounting for the correlations among trials. Um, and so I showed you, I have estimates of the correlation among trials from mega LMM. And so if we use mega LMM to do these predictions, whenever there are trials that, you know, say are moderately correlated with each other, we should get better predictions in all of those by sharing information across that. Um, and so this is just the result of that, you know, for basically all of the traits and all of the trials, we get an incremental improvement in our prediction accuracy by, by putting it all in together. Um, and so, you know, to some extent, we can predict G by E, and uh, we can do it better by genetics than we can do it based on the environment that they came from. So the last question is, uh, can we identify loci that control this G by E? So we'd say a locus controls G by E if we state a substitution, say, from the A to the T in a particular line, and now the line went from reacting to the environment to having a different reaction. So if the response to the environment changed after that substitution. That's what we ideally want, but we're not gonna do that in, in all, the, all the individuals and all the lines. So instead we're, we'll use association mapping methods. Um, and so we'll select a bunch of lines that have the A, a bunch of lines that have the T, measure the response to the environment in each of them and ask whether there's a mean change in that plasticity. So this is just standard GWAS, but the trade is the response to the environment. But there are um, some challenges in doing G by E GWAS like this um, uh, relative to standard GWAS. Uh, the first is population structure. In a regular GWAS, we often worry about population structure correction. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, in G by E GWAS, we have to do also, but we have to correct for population structure in every trial and in every covariance parameter across any pair of trials. So there's a lot of population possibilities for population structure to get in the way. We have to also account for the residual correlation structure among the trials. Another thing I didn't mention is that these trials are not complete. Only a few hundred to maybe a couple thousand lines were grown in each trial, overlapping subsets of them. And that means that doing this in a, in a meta-analysis approach would be much simpler, is, is really complicated because of sort of weird correlation structures among the estimates. Um, and so that's not a great solution. And then the data sets are, are reasonably large here. Um, for our largest one plant height, we have over 19,000 observations across 23 trials. And so that means that we have to estimate 552 variance components. And if we did that separately for each of the 380,000 markers, I would not have the results today. Um, so uh, yeah, so how, how can we go about this? Well, 
mega LMM, as I presented before, actually gives us a, a way to do these GWASs, I think, quite accurately and, and efficiently. So if we start with the correlated traits model, like I showed before, we can use it to learn this covariance structure. We have a genetic covariance structure, a residual covariance structure across the, um, across the environment. Now, it, it turns out it's actually easier to, to model or test GBIE effects in the reaction norm model. So I'm going to switch over to that one. And I'll, I'll introduce for a particular marker that I'm interested in uh, two more terms, a main effect of that marker and a GBIE main effect for the marker and a G by E for that marker. And I want to test if that G by E term is zero. But test is easy. I just tested any, if there's a marker, if a G by E term in any of the environments, and use an F test for that. But the complicated part is the remainder, which is that error covariance. And that's where there are those 550 parameters that I have to estimate. Well, I have them all right there. Because I said, this is the same model, the correlated trace model and reaction model are exactly the same. This is just a different representation of that one. And so I can just directly use the estimates I have from that model uh, as my error term here. Um, this isn't new. This is the same model that's used by MTMM or a multivariate version of Emma X um, that's, that are widely used. The, the, I think the advantage or the, you know, the extension here is that because mega LMM is able to estimate these parameters or these covariance parameters pretty well, we're able to extend this multi-trait uh, GWAS to very large numbers of traits um, and, and do it accurately. So here's, oops, went too far. Here are just two, um, just to show that it, it works, um, two example Manhattan plots. So on the left, the points are showing the association strength um, for particular markers against cob weight, or for, particularly for G by E for cob weight across 15 trials. And then on the right, uh, associations with flowering time across 21 trials. And um, there are some peaks here um, that I think are significant. Um, in total across the six traits, there are dozens of, of candidate loci that seem uh, to uh, control or, or be associated with gene environment interactions. Just to pick out one of them, this is the, the top peak on the left for cob weight and the estimated effect sizes of that locus in each of the 15 trials. And you see why the model is, is saying that this should be G by E. Uh, there's a large effect, say, in this trial on the right, medium effects in some other trials, and little effect in another one. So, you know, it's picking up what we want it to pick up. So, to summarize, I, I started by showing that there's, that there's local adaptation. And then for the G by E, I said, I showed that all of the variation is G by E. There's no, you know, con constant effects of, of genotype across trials, which, which we expect. We have some ability to predict it, um, and that should make uh, selecting lines more useful. And we identify dozens of candidate loci. So, um, yeah, I think that this this approach of doing G by E GWAS with GWAS with mega LMM works great, and we should be able to take these results and go back to the germplasm banks and 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 start selecting accessions, right? Well, actually, no, I don't. I don't think we're there yet. Um, and the, the thing is, I think that uh, I'm not at all confident that these loci that I've identified or these accessions that I've identified here are actually going to be useful or actually going to replicate under new environments that might be actually relevant for farmers. And that's because G by E, as I've defined it, is really just a super vague concept. I've never hinted that before. Any difference in any condition, no matter what causes it, is G by E. Until the G by E is replicated, and ideally linked to particular environmental factors, I don't think it's a useful thing. So here's what I mean. Sometimes G by E is super interesting and fascinating and generates key biological insights. So in this example, um, the, uh, this is the showing the variation response to, to dark among uh, different mutants in Arabidopsis in the length of the hypocotyl, and this is giving us key insight into the mechanisms of light singling. That's a cool G by E. Other G by E that we might pick up are really technical in origin. So a common one is, is changes in scale. So a couple of example of that is, is flowering time. We often see with flowering time that there's, if you grow plants in an environment where everyone flowers very fast, um, there's a little very you know, small differences among genotypes. But if you take it to another environment where everyone flowers uh, late, there's wide difference in genotypes. Different slopes, that's G by E. But if you change, instead of calling it flowering time, 
you call it flower, flowering rate, the speed of flowering, transform exactly the same data, and now we have no G by E. So that's not very satisfying if G by E is just dependent on sort of how we constructed the problem, rather than not sort of some fundamental biology. This was discussed before. G by E, in the sense of an association study, can be uh, due to changes in linkage. We have somewhat different populations in our different trials. Um, it can also be due to unique things about a particular field, that particular year, the way it was particularly grown that may never happen again. These types of things are not useful for breeding. Um, so, but they are indistinguishable in our tests. So how do we uh, refine the way that we're uh, thinking about? Well, my argument is that G by E is only useful if uh, we can demonstrate that it's consistently predictable based on environmental uh, characteristics. So in this example, I've oriented the, um, or organized the trials from lowest to highest elevation. And we see that the effects are strongest in the higher elevation. We have to be careful about this though, because we have multiple times where we use the same field in different years, and those aren't independent. Here, you know, one highland field is not representative of all highland fields. Here are three different highland fields in Mexico that differ in all sorts of characteristics from soil to humidity and so on. We have to sample many different fields before we start to be confident that there's a true association with elevation. So how do we prioritize variants that, that replicate across multiple environmental gradients? Well, in the, in the GWAS context, the way I'm gonna do this is I'll take the um, G by E term for my marker here, and I'm gonna break it apart into two components. In the red on the left, I, I'll use a, a general additive model or a smooth function to model the effect, you know, how, the, how this marker's effect changes as you move across the environmental gradient, um, allowing it to be nonlinear, um, but, but with probably consistent effects. And then on the right, I'll use a random effect to uh, represent the location by, by SNP interaction. And effectively what this does is it allows us to um, treat that the SNP effect in each location as a unit of replication. I'm not gonna trust these G by E unless I've replicated that SNP effect in multiple, say, uh, multiple locations with a similar value for the environment. Um, this highlights that we need lots of environments to be able to do G by E modeling well. Um, I fit this with a modified version of the MGCV or GAM4 functions, two loci that were previously identified as being candidates for G by E. And so here's a couple of quick examples. This is a locus that affects G by E in flowering. We see a large effect in lowland fields, not much of an effect in highland fields. It's an interesting locus because this locus we actually know from other work is tags a large inversion that was introgressed into highland days from a wild relative. It's a kind of cool story. Here's another locus that sort of has the opposing pattern, has no effect in lowland fields, but a, an increasing effect as you get into very highland fields. It's, it's in the middle of a gene known as RAP 2.7, which is also a known flowering gene in maize. But contrast that with this G by E locus here, um, which is a, a locus that's associated with G by E in field weight, but it's G by E because in one trial in one year, we saw a very different effect, but all, no, never, never again. This one never re replicated. So, you know, it might be biologically interesting, but not yet. Uh, the other two are much closer to being able to give to breeders and be able to say, I have a prediction for this is gonna be useful in particular contexts. So that's what I'm trying to do with this is to be able to prioritize uh, among these hits in, in ways. So to, to fully summarize now, um, the main idea of this work is that germplasm repositories are humongous and untapped resources for climate adaptation. Um, we can use genetics and G by E modeling to prioritize loci and accessions um, in those huge uh, um, data or yeah, repositories. Um, but um, uh, I want to finally argue that loci with effects that replicate across environmental gradients are the ones that I really need to focus on. And those are the ones that I'm, I'll be more likely to take to um, breeding programs and say that they uh, uh, may have, may be useful. And finally, I think that this, uh, you know, this pipeline here, mega LMM into MGCV, um, is, is a powerful approach that um, should be widely applicable and is pretty efficient. And so I'd be happy to talk to you about it uh, for your own work. And so with that, I uh, acknowledge uh, many collaborators um, who did all of the hard work here and funding sources. And 
uh, thanks again for the wonderful conference. I think we have time for one quick question. Hey, Andy Kern from Oregon, wherever I'm from these days. Um, so one thing that this makes me think of, so really nice work. Um, so if we're thinking about climate adaptation and we're thinking about G, you know, mapping G by E, presumably the climate's gonna be changing beyond what we're mapping in currently. So can you extrapolate? Is there any power to do forecasting out of this kind of approach? Um, like any, any regression, Forecasting outside of your range is not very, uh, very smart. Um, but there are a lot of places that will warm to the temperature that other places already are at. And corn, as this example that I'm using here, spans a tremendous range of environments. And so if you are in a moderate elevational field in, in Mexico at a you know, moderate elevation right now, that's going to be like a low elevation field um, that today. And so why not go into those fields? Well, lines that are genetically predicted to be um, adapted in those fields and look for alleles there. So presumably you're, you get into a situation of environment matching. Yeah. Um, or yeah, predicted environment matching, sure. Pr predicted environment matching. Okay, cool. Thanks. I know you don't have time for another question, so I'd want to thank Daniel. Uh, but I, I just wanted to uh, take a moment to recognize that challenging, you know, that organizing a conference is very challenging. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Jeff, Amelia, Jose, Brandon, Susie, and others for just a fantastic meeting. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, uh, 